Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the laureate lecture of the 2018 Tum Prize in Rule of Law. To begin with, we would like to invite to the stage the host of this lecture, Professor Paul Craig, Professor of English Law from Oxford University, to give us the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Professor Craig. Good morning, everybody. It is a very great pleasure to be introducing Professor Joseph Raz, who has been awarded the Tang Prize for the Rule of Law 2018. This is more especially so since his lectures on jurisprudence first introduced me to the subject. Joseph was at that time a fellow and tutor in Balliol, College Oxford, and I was a law student in Oxford from 1970 to 1974. It was readily apparent, even at that relatively early stage in Joseph's career, that he was a leader in the field of analytical legal philosophy. Oxford has a long and prestigious tradition in this area, as exemplified by Herbert Hart's seminal work on the concept of law. Joseph Raz developed and refined the theory of legal positivism as attested to by his first major work, which was entitled The Concept of a Legal System, published in 1970. His position as a leader in this field has been reinforced over the subsequent 45 years, during which he has produced path-breaking works on legal and political philosophy. These works have deepened our understanding of the very nature of law, legal reasoning, and the relationship between law, morality, and freedom. He has written broadly on a wide range of topics, including the rule of law, legal positivism, legitimate authority, normativity, reasons, and perfectionist liberalism. His contributions have taken the form of books, law review articles, book chapters, as well as prestigious lectures. Analytical acuity, philosophical subtlety, and normative rigor are the hallmarks of his scholarship. It is this combination that have made his writings an invaluable source for anyone working in legal, moral, and political philosophy. Let me just share with you one very personal vignette about my time in Oxford. Joseph will probably have forgotten this, but it was a rather wonderful occasion. Joseph was giving a lecture on legal philosophy. I was a graduate student at the time. And Joseph was delivering the lecture and there was actually a rather annoying student in the audience who put up his hand one time and said, um, Dr. Raz, can you please tell me the authority for that proposition? Uh, the student imagining that somehow in legal theory, authority for a particular proposition would take the form of a citation to a House of Lords decision or a Supreme Court case which is obviously not so. Nonetheless, on the first occasion, Joseph treated the, qu the question seriously and explained some of the reasoning behind how he got to the position. The time marched on, and a second occasion, the student then put up his hand again and said, Dr. Raz, can you tell me the authority for that proposition? Even as a student, I could see Joseph was getting a little bit irked by this at the time. But nonetheless, he answered in good humor and explained the reasoning which had led him to that position. Another 10 minutes went past, and yet a third occasion, on a third occasion, the student yet again put up his hand in a rather whiny type voice and said, Dr. Raz, what is the authority for that proposition? At which point, Joseph looked him straight in the eye and said, it is from my notes and then move straight on. 
I look very much forward to hearing Joseph's insight in his lecture today, which is entitled The Law's Own Virtue. Please welcome this year's Tang Laureate in the Rule of Law, Professor Joseph Raz. Thank you all for coming. We can think about the rule of law as a virtue the law should possess. It is one of the main virtues the law should have, and as such, exploring it contributes to an understanding of the nature of law and its role in our life. The law is a structure of rules, institutions, practices, and the common understanding that unites them which normally are an aspect of some social organization, state, city, university, corporation. International law is a possible exception, not being united by its relation to a single corporation, to a single organization. When exploring the role of the law, we study its essential properties its relations to the organizations whose law it is, and to the people's life and thought more generally. The rule of law, as I will understand it, is a specific virtue or ideal the law should conform to. There is no general agreement uh, about what it is. This lack of agreement is common to important normative institutions and principles, like freedom of speech, and is often a source of strength. People unite in supporting such institutions and principles in spite of diverse views about their nature. There is no point in verbal disputes about which ideals deserve to be called the rule of law, but there is a point in clarity and avoiding confusion. Hence my proposal, which is really an endorsement of one common view. I will explore the nature of the rule of law by drawing an analogy with the conditions of individual prosperity. People are born into a society with its cultures and norms. They are culturate and learn to make their own life creatively using the opportunities and observing the limits set by the cultural norms. A process that is, enable, that, that is enabled by familiarity and understanding how things work and predictability, ability to plan and make decisions for the future because one can, within limits, predict their impact. Absent that enabling background, disorientation, loss of sense of one's command of oneself and one's situation, loss of self-respect ensue. Now think of the law. 
Governments come to power in an existing social and legal culture and norms whose stability and predictability are essential to the well-being of individuals. The rule of law consists of the principles that constrain the way government's actions change and apply the law to make sure, among other things, that they maintain stability and predictability and thus enable individuals to find a way and to live well. Hence, the rule of law principles are not about the content of the law, but about its mode of generation and application. It requires that legal decisions and rules be anchored in stable general doctrines made for publicly available reasons, applied faithfully, observing due process, and more. Importantly, these conditions of individual and social prosperity are universal. Different societies have different cuisines, different social relations and manners, different economic structures, different religions, or none. But all require stability and predictability, and above all, they must be intelligible to those subject to them for people to feel at home within the framework of their law and to have the confidence and self-reliance to plan their life. Hence the universality of the rule of law, uniting cultures that otherwise differ and therefore providing a crucial framework for mutual toleration individually and socially and enabling worldwide cultural and economic exchanges. So I will start with a first step at understanding more precisely the rule of law as it applies to state law, so these ideas can be readily expanded to other contexts. I refer to the rule of law as a virtue possessed by a legal system that conforms to the doctrine of the rule of law and whose public culture resists deviation from it. The doctrine consists of principles united in the rationale and articulating various aspects of that rationale, various ways in which it ought to be implemented. Some of the principles that belong to the doctrine of the rule of law are common to virtually all accounts of the doctrine. Government is by law, meaning first, reasonably clear, secondly, reasonably stable, thirdly, publicly available, fourthly, ge uh, general rules and standards that are, fifthly, applied prospectively and not retrospectively. So these are my five starting principles. What is common to them? What makes them one doctrine rather than a hodgepodge of principles? One popular view is that they make it possible for those subject to the law to find out what it is and thereby make it possible for the government to know how to govern and for those subject to the law, subject to the government, to know how they are governed. And the analogy that I started with explains why this is important why this is important. But there are problems with this idea, with this explanation of the rationale for the rule of law. The principles that I mentioned, all five of them, are vague, allowing of various degrees of compliance. Now that in itself, you would say, is no problem. It is true of many principles. The difficulty is that the rule of law gives no guidance as to the required degree of compliance. Worse still, it is impossible to implement this principle to a very high degree. Discretion is inevitable for the executive and administrative organs and for the courts. Moreover, discretion is desirable. 
Without it, the law is blind to exceptional circumstances, to the need to refine laws in application and to adjust them to changes in the world. Taken to extreme, the rule of law principles, as I articulated them, militate against any legislation, any changing in the law, which is absurd. So how are we to respond to that uh, problem? One response is to say that one should allow for deviation from the principles only to the minimum degree required for adequate government, governance. But the problem is that there is no such degree. Here and there, in special cases, one can find examples where deviation is necessary and beyond which it should not happen. But that does not amount to a general test of necessity, and no such test can be found. Instead, I suggest, we should realize that the rule of law doctrine has been inadequately identified so far. Perhaps simply only part of it was stated. So without disowning, without discarding the sensible part of the five principles, we need to further explore and develop our understanding of the doctrine. We can start again noting that at least one commonly agreed aim of the rule of law is to avoid arbitrary government. We can state that as a, to take that as a clue, helping with further developing our understanding of the rule of law. First thing to note is that the five principles which I've listed as a first step do not eliminate the possibility of arbitrary government. For example, a paradigm case of arbitrary power is the use of public power for the enrichment of those in power or of their friends and relations. And the five principles that I mentioned do not exclude self-enrichment. They merely restrict the ways, the means by which it can be achieved. And that shows that pursuing the clue, avoid arbitrary, uh, arbitrary power, may help in enriching our understanding of the rule of law. But what is arbitrary government? What is arbitrary action generally? It is action indifferent to the reasons for and against taking it. Arbitrary government is the use of power that is indifferent to the proper reasons which should, for which that power should be used. What are the reasons that should guide governments? And indifference to, uh, to which is arbitrary government? Well, governments are constituted by law, and in creating them, the law explicitly or implicitly identifies the pur its purposes, the purposes for which uh, governments may act. It is their nature as government that they ought to follow and apply the law, though the law may create exemptions, exceptions which uh, exempt governments from having to obey some laws. But, you might ask, why is it a virtue for governments to obey the law? Well, remember that by its nature, the law claims to possess moral legitimacy, and by their natures, Governments are law's instruments for their application and development, for the application and development of the law. So, in as much as the rule of law requires governments to be faithful to the law, it is a moral doctrine. But, you may remind me, not all legal systems are morally legitimate. Does it follow that the rule of law does not apply to those which are not? For there is no moral virtue in applying their law. Not quite. What does follow is that its application is more modulated and that regarding some laws, there may be no reason at all to apply them. But for the most part, as the analogy which guides me throughout this talk, 
with the conditions of individual prosperity and it shows that there is still reason to follow the law in most cases, even if uh, some of the reasons to follow it may be overridden. The rule of law is not an absolute reason. It's a important reason, as we say. It can always be uh, conflict with other reasons and sometimes be overridden by them. So two crucial points should be borne in mind. First, not every failure of the government to be guided by law is a breach of the rule of law. For the most part, such failure is due to mistakes and incompetence. Even the most conscientious and qualified government is liable to fail in these ways. And such failure does not manifest indifference to the reasons that should, be, should guide the government. Second, it would be a mistake to think that obeying the law narrowly understood is the only guide for governmental action. For one thing, inevitably governments have considerable discretionary powers, and for another thing, in interpreting the law, as they must do, they are guided by certain reasons and must avoid others. Is there a general way, then, to characterize which reasons should and which should not guide them. Determining what ends to pursue in the exercise of, of discretionary powers or in the interpretation of the law is the stuff of ordinary politics, and the rule of law does not review the success of politics. But the very nature of governments as governments produces a clue to the purpose that they may pursue or those which they may not. Arbitrariness, we remember, is indifference to whether governmental action accords with its purposes. And this seems to be a simple and helpful idea. But there are difficulties when we think about it, forcing us, while accepting that the rule of law excludes arbitrary government, to realize that we have further questions to answer. Here is a difficulty. What constitutes indifference by government as to whether it pursues an aim that government may legitimately pursue, both in interpreting the law and in exercising discretionary powers? It cannot depend entirely on the government's claim. And I'll give you a ridiculously simple example. Imagine a government by a sole hereditary ruler, call him Rex. Rex has ordered the purchase of a very expensive diamond ring for his lover. He claims that he was entitled to do so because his lover would be very pleased with the gift. And this is a very good reason for gifts between lovers, using the private property for the purpose. Rex's mistake is failing to realize that even though he controls the public purse, he does not own it. Rex appears to lack the distinction between the rights and powers of governments and the rights of powers of private owners. Perhaps in his country, the distinction does not apply. It has not always applied everywhere. In which case, the rule of law does not apply to his country. If the constitution of his country does recognize a distinction, then his act is against the rule of law, for he cannot claim to have acted in pursuit of a purpose which could be the purpose of government. The difficulty is that on the one hand, he cannot be said to have acted arbitrarily, that is, in indifference to reason. He thought that he had good reason for his action. On the other hand, his mistake is more basic than an ordinary mistake about the purposes of, that government should pursue. It is a mistake in thinking that he has the rights of private owners. So indifference to reason, arbitrary use of power, is only one way in which one can offend against the rule of law. Another is acting for purposes 
which is clearly not one which governments are entitled to pursue. Doing so is not being indifferent to reason, but is not something that any government can legitimately do. It is excluded by the very nature of government. Therefore, saying that it is excluded is not a matter of taking sides in political debates about which purposes this or that government should pursue. It is no more than insisting that it should act as government. So we come to a new question. What is it to act as a government? Governments are there not to promote their own interests, but that of what? Various suggestions appeal, but I will stop with the most obvious one. The interests of the governed, understood broadly to include the moral interests of the governed. This seems plausible. The justification of rules of law and of governmental actions should be that they are, as we say, in the interest of the government. Several ideas coalesce around this core. The interests of all the governed is what we have in mind, and they should be given their proper significance and importance. Secondly, the governed broadly understood include anyone directly impacted by government action. But the government may have, to, may have special duties to look after the interests of some people because it is their government in a special way. Governments are custodians of the public interest of those whose government they are. They should be mindful of the interests of others as well. But where those others have their own government, their own custodians, responsibility is shared. Their custodians have special standing to decide how to protect and advance their interest. Our government may not take over that role, the role of their government. So the duty of those whose government it is is special. Implementing this is a complex, context sensitive, and is bound to be controversial. But we can say that governments conform to the rule of law when they act in the exercise of their power according to law. Governments claim to be morally legitimate in part because they are constituted by a legitimate system of law, and that law provides reasons that bind the government that it constitutes. The governments act arbitrarily when not trying to follow the law. The test of conforming to the rule of law, according to the conception of it that I am developing, is acting with manifest intention to serve the interest of the governed, as expressed by the law and its, morally, and its moral proper interpretation and implementation. <clears throat> so it's a, you conform so long as you act with manifest intention to serve the interests of the government, as expressed by the law by, and morally proper interpretation and implementation. This requires conformity to what we know as the main features of public accountability. So we add principles to the five we started with. The reasons for which decisions are made should be publicly declared. Now, you may immediately say that this is overstating it, that this is excessive. Surely the reasons for some decisions need not be made public. And this is true. But all rule of law principles, as I've already stated, are pro tanto reasons which can be overridden by conflicting considerations. Seven, the process of reaching a decision should be fair and unbiased. Eight, 
it should allow proper opportunities to consider the relevant arguments and the information. And here, various degrees of representation and hearing are involved. Ninth, the decisions should be reasonable relative to their declared purposes. <clears throat> Unreasonable decisions raise doubt as whether they were taken for the declared reasons. If that was your purpose, you wouldn't have done that. You do that, you say that that was your purpose, but this is unbelievable. This is just incredible. Tenth, there are presumptive conventions about what constitutes, con constitutes conformity or breach of the rule of law. The burden of establishing that government actions were undertaken in the belief that they serve the interests of the governed is a very heavy one. In practice, the rule of law requirements are met by officials conducting legal business according to conventions of how to do so, how to legislate, adjudicate, issue executive orders, and so on. Conventions that conform to the other requirements of the rule of law, of course. These conventions become involved in all official functions, and they raise a double rebuttable presumption that observing them serves the interest of the government and that the officials who follow them act in the interests of the government, of the government, sorry, as they see it. Eleven, my final principle, is that the doctrine of the rule of law and its main implications should be part of the public culture embedded in education and public discourse and taken as obvious and vital by all. The principles it embodies should be above political controversy, though their detailed application and implementation will inevitably not be above such disputes. At this point, I'm skipping part of what is indicated in your handout. And move to section 9.6. And this part of the complete talk, more than what I just delivered, I'm engaged in defending the idea of the rule of law as I articulated it so far. So I hope that what I said is already partly a defense of it <clears throat> just by appealing to our moral understanding of how government should conduct themselves. But there are more specific defenses and rebuttals of criticism that I'm not going into. But I want to mention one or two points in that context. <clears throat> one very important point that I want to mention is the complex relationship between the rule of law itself being a moral doctrine and other moral principles. I think that it can be described as a two-way street. The rule of law borrows from other moral principles and it also contributes to the generation of new derivative moral principles. How does it borrow? I mentioned that the implementation of the doctrine requires reliance on conventions which may vary from time to time and from place to place. Now, where well, there is a moral principle of some weight, so that its violation, even by legal institutions, is rarely justified, 
And if it deals, among other things, with the way institutions work, then it makes sense to incorporate it into the rule of law doctrine as one of its conventions. And I gave only one example, but there could be others, which is the rule of Audi alteram partem. There are general reasons of fairness, independently of rule of law, general reasons of fairness to listen to a person who might be disadvantaged by a decision. These reasons are putanto. I do not have to listen to everyone who may be disadvantaged by something I do. Though I have reason to do so when this would be practicable. Now it makes sense that the requirement that courts and other organs of the law should do so is generally taken to be one of the principles of the rule of law. So it is, it is a rebuttable presumption that action of some legal organs is arbitrary and thus a violation of the rule of law, as well as unfair if it violates the Audi alter impartum principle. So this is an example where independent moral principles contribute and enrich the rule of law. <laughs> but as I said, the rule of law also contributes to, mor to morality and generates derivative moral principle. Don't think that derivative means unimportant. Most of the moral principles that we live by are derivative moral principles. Never mind, uh, we, we are not going there, but uh, that just explains that my use of derivative doesn't mean unimportant. This may happen in various ways, but again, to give just one example, the most common way is due to the fact that when observed, the rule of law generates expectations that its principles will be observed. And we will often justifiably rely on them being observed in a variety of individual cases. So through the principles of respecting justified expectations, the conventions of the rule of law acquire an independent moral force, independent that of the rationale of the doctrine of the rule of law and deriving from the general principle of respecting justified expectations. I must add two caveats. First, my remarks emphasized some benefits of uh, similarity in the application of the doctrine to various branches of the law and to the law of different countries. But the principles through which the rule of law is applied allow considerable room for flexibility and adaptability. Their application to banking law may differ in suitable ways from their application to dealing with juvenile delinquency, and their application in common law jurisdictions may differ from their application in civil law jurisdictions without compromising the rationale which underlies them. The rule of law can be observed while respecting significant variations between countries and uh, that express variations which express respect for their local traditions. It is easy to see the flexibility in application of the doctrine when we consider that it applies not only to the law of states, but also to the law of, say, voluntary associations. Their law, the law of associations, is also meant to serve some common good and should not be arbitrary or self-serving. Yet we would not expect that the rulemaking ways of associations or their methods of dispute resolution would conform to precisely the same principles that we must insist apply to the rule of states to the law of states. Besides the fact that the implementation of the, of the rule of law is mediated by conventions that establish rebuttable presumptions, give plenty of room to adaptability to, legal, uh, to local conditions. So for example, in some countries, disputes of certain kinds are settled 
by litigation in front of judges and jury, defiation is a violation of the rule of law. In other countries, juries are unheard of, and disputes of that very same kind or of different kinds are settled by panels of experts, and in them, deviation from this procedure is a breach, breach of the rule of law. So I'm emphasizing the adaptability of the rule of law to local traditions, for it is a condition for it qualifying as a universal moral doctrine and helps refute criticism that it is a manifestation of one culture imposing its norms on others. But it is time to mention briefly my second caveat. While conformity to the rule of law has clear moral benefits, it does not guarantee that justice, democracy, and respect for human rights prevail. To avoid injustice and other moral blemishes, the all must possess other moral virtues as well. So this is the reason for its great value. All the advantages of conformity to the rule of law that I mentioned are byproducts of the main virtue, acting uh, with a manifest intention to protect and advance the interests of the government. Based on the main, uh, based in the main on only two premises, that governments may act only in the interests of the governed, and that honest mistakes about what it is and what it entails are the stuff of ordinary politics, and honest mistakes about this do not violate the rule of law, I concluded that the virtue of the rule of law lies in tending to secure that governments act with a manifest intention of serving the interests of the government. It would, of course, be nice if everyone agreed with that idea, with that understanding. But not everyone does. My defense of the doctrine of the rule of law depends on the soundness of the premises, not on everyone's agreement with them. Still, the doctrine, as I understand it, does serve to protect the concerns of people who dispute the premises. For example, if one deeply believes that the only purpose the law of the law is to do God's will, then serving God's will is one of that person's interests. And the law in serving people's interests will serve that interest as well as others. This would not eliminate the disagreement but it will facilitate peaceful uh, coexistence. It would be foolish to claim that conformity to the rule of law can eliminate arbitrary use of power altogether, but it greatly helps in reducing it. Perhaps more disturbingly, sometimes action in, the, in breach of the rule of law can in fact serve the interests of the governed well. Sometimes violation of the rule of law is the only way in which important interests of the people can be protected. The rule of law is an important moral doctrine, but on occasion its violation may be justified. To conclude, the rule of law protects us from arbitrary use of power and from similar abuses of power. It makes it a moral doctrine of great importance. Confidence that the law observes it is a condition of confidence in the law and the government generally, and thus a condition of their ability to govern well. So while the rule of law does not secure conformity to the other moral principles, that the law should conform to, it is close to being a condition for the law's ability to conform to them. That view, the rule of law is a condition 
for the law ability to protect and put, uh, follow other moral principles is recognized in innumerable international documents which urge that securing the rule of law is a condition of respect for human rights, for principles of justice, and more. Perhaps not surprisingly, precisely the fact that the rule of law protects us from wrongs which the law's existence creates the opportunities for, makes it the specific virtue of the law as law, it protects us from evils that are possible because we have law. And that makes it a specific virtue of law as law. And a universal doctrine applying to all legal systems, the laws on virtue, respect for which is needed for the law to have any other virtues. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Raz. Please take your seat. Thank you. And now we would like to invite back to the stage Professor Paul Craig to give us the conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Craig. Thank you very much indeed, Joseph, for that very stimulating and interesting lecture. It's a testimony to a, of a, to a great scholar that a great scholar will revisit a concept in which he made a seminal, or to which he made a seminal contribution four decades ago in the famous Law Quarterly Review article on the rule of law. And it was truly fascinating for me to be privileged to be in the audience today and to listen to Joseph embellish, refine, and develop the concept that he first wrote so authoritatively about in the late 1970s. So thank you again, Joseph, and congratulations for being the 2018 Laureate for the Rule of Law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Craig. And thank you again to Dr. Raz. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the Rule of Law lecture. Thank you for your participation. If you have any questions regarding this lecture, you're welcome to join the press conference on the first floor. 各位来宾，第三届唐奖得奖人演讲法制场到此圆满的告一个段落，非常感谢您今天的参与。若您希望针对演讲的内容提问，请移驾至一楼的前瞻厅。离场的时候，请记得您随身携带的物品，并归还您
human rights, the rule of law should be able to protect. And in some countries, local traditions are used as a just justification for uh, rights violations. What do you think? Um, so my question is, what do you think that adaptive Adaptability to local tradition is, is important, and how do you think that uh, how to reconcile local traditions with the univer universality of the rule of law? And secondly, you uh, mentioned the principles, five principles, uh, eleven principles of the rule of law, and uh, you think that the rule of law can contribute to morality and generate the derivative moral principles. Uh, so I would like to ask you, what do you see as the ch major challenges to the development of the rule of law? Thank you. Um, I have the difficulty in...好,所以刚刚的中央社的记者提出的两个问题,就是Russ教授刚刚在演讲当中有提到了法治它很重要,但是它必须要去尊重不同国家的文化差异,同时也要能够因应不同地方的传统。一个调整应应的能力来跟法治的普世价值能够相互配合第二个问题要问的是您在演讲当中提出了法治的十一个原则那也提到了法治的施行它可以对于道德的原则有所贡献也能够产生一些衍生性的道德原则那么在执行上面
uh, street mugging to cyber uh, offenses. And you always adapt the law and with it the rule of law to th those conditions. There is no change to the universality of, of them, but there is a change in what you apply them to. You apply them to different conditions. I don't know whether this meets the first question or not. Okay, how? So, so,刚刚讲到的这个法治呢,它的确还有在这种普世的原则性,但是它的应用上当然必须要一定条件的配合。所以假设举一个例子,我说原则上我们应该要去尊重,要去保护这些生病或者是比较弱势的族群,但是也
And of course, there were no expectations of this kind when computers were unreliable at the beginning of their history, or indeed before they appeared. And so on. So the, the general idea of uh, respecting justified expectations leads to principles which, with time, become kind of self-standing. Everybody knows this is a principle. I wish I could give you an example of that, but I don't have now anything in mind. And we forget their origins, the way the principle came to, to apply. And these, are, these will be the principles with application in particular context, context where they justified expectations apply. So that was just, uh, in my talk, it was just an attempt to show that uh, moral principles are not standalone principles, but they interact in sometimes surprising way. And the Audi Alteram Partem, you adopt a principle of justice into the doctrine of the, moral, of the rule of law. In the case of justified expectation, you export from the rule of law principles which become independent of it when the expectations persist independently of matters to do with the rule of law. So, okay. 那么如果说要做到刚刚您讲的这一个 这些道德所谓的原则，它有可能是彼此之间，你做到A可能就会违反了B的一个原则。那当然，这些不同的一个道德的要求，它有可能它的内容彼此之间也会有。相互的影响那刚刚我在演讲当中主要要提的就是说今天呢我们在看这种所谓的一般性的原则的时候它其实也会纳入对于大家的一种期望的一个理解也就是说会把大家的一些期望在不同的情境之下它会有的期望也会列
would you give or could you give us some suggestions about how to do transitional justice, especially while Taiwan we are now engaging in these issues? So uh, is my question clear? Thank you. Okay, 好，所以这个问题呢，主要要问的是转型正义。我们都知道，在二次世界大战之后呢，转型正义成为大家一直在争论的一个议题。那我想请问 Russ 教授，如果是放在您今天所讲的法治的理论跟原则之下，我们应该要怎么样理解转型正义？特别是台湾目前正在就转型正义来做很严肃的一个讨论跟这个呃追求的时候，可不可以请 Russ 教授给我们一些建言？ Uh, thank you for this very difficult question. Um, <clears throat> as you know, it's not a topic that I've written about, so I'm just thinking on my feet, as it were, in expressing general thought. Um, and uh, I am not uh, going to address any situation. In any country, the problem arose in many countries in the, of the last 30 years, and of course, many others. If you look at the earlier period, uh, but I'm not going to express an opinion about either the situation or the solutions in any of those countries. Just uh, by way of general reflection, I, I want to say. Uh, <laughs> Start by making a general observation about the way different countries have coped with or struggled with the、uh, problem, which is, it is. We all come to it without experience. It's there are not many precedents which we can rely on, principles which we can straightforwardly. Apply, and different countries. Of course, they have different circumstances. Problems are different, but different countries have struggled extremely interestingly in trying to respond to the issues of transitional justice, and came with very different solutions. Sometimes, sometimes there is, and of course, great influence.、Uh, By what one country did on on other countries, and I think that in in reflection about it, and in leading to action later on in each one in in their own individual cases, that's the way to go to reflect on the experience, the achievements, the successes, and the failures of different solutions and. Improvise because, as I said, it's it's new to us. We don't know how to do it. So I want to to give you an analogy which illustrates the paradox in the situation that we confront in transitional justice. And then think of war. We are waiting. I mean, it's a different situation, but I just want to show an analogy. We are waiting a war against the country. While we are waging a war, we have to think about what will happen after we win. Assuming that we have some chance of winning, many people wage wars without any chance of winning. But that's a different story. Suppose we think there is a chance that we win. While we are engaging in the war, we have to think what will happen then. Most likely, that country will lose its current government because it will be a defeated government, and a new government will happen. Most likely, that country, the losing country, will have suffered considerable human losses, economic losses, destruction of infrastructure, and、uh, productive capacity, and the whole generation is very likely. Uh, was affected. Uh, life chances will be completely changed by the, the effect of the war. It could lead to a disaster. Winning the war could be a greater disaster than the war itself, or indeed even when losing the war, 
because of the consequences. So while we are fighting the war, we have to think about what will happen later. And we have to modi uh, modify our combat activities in order not to lead to the post-success, post-triumph disaster. Now, in, in the case of uh, transitional justice, it's not quite like that. We've already won, we assume. There has been a fundamental change, a regime which suffered from many fundamental defects has been replaced by a more humane and uh, just one. But at that point, we face a similar problem. The problem is whether this triumph of justice and humanity will be self-defeating because within our country, there are winners and losers. And there are, in all situations where there has been an unjust, oppressive regime, there were many people who built their life on the presumption that that regime will continue, not because they are supporting its policies, the unjust and oppressive policies, but because they want to leave. They wanted to uh, earn enough money not to starve. They wanted to pursue interests in ac academic interests, in artistic interests, sports interests, other things. But the only way to do this is to find a way of accommodating to life within the oppressive regime. That's the assumption. And we have to make, I mean, we have to bear in mind that the important thing now that uh, the regime has changed and we have a more humane and just one is that we have that all the people of our country are our brothers and sisters metaphorically speaking that they are all human beings who not only deserve respect as human beings but with whom we want to continue to live together People in Guatemala deserve my respect as human beings, but I don't live together with them. But in the situation of transitional justice, we want to keep to live, living together. And we have to find solution to the very tough problems of transitional justice, bearing that in mind. And that leads to various ways of conciliation and various distinctions. Lots of the oppressive actions of uh, regimes are against the laws of those very regimes. And they present, and of any regime, you know, they're against uh, principles of justice which are recognized in the laws of most countries, perhaps with some express exceptions. Uh, but most countries, not only now our country, but it's, and they are violations of the law of the of oppressive regime. So they, that's one category of cases. Then there are lots of people who are in different categories. They obeyed orders of wicked laws, which are, has been replaced, but were at, lawful at the time, held by the courts not to be lawful at the time. And uh, in those cases, we of course, we tend to go for the higher authorities which gave the orders and perhaps find a way of reconciliation with the people who carried out the orders just because they were caught in a dilemma within the three. So there are lots of, um, you know, the complexity is endless. There is no solution which fits all. But there is one thing which I think does fit all the need to continue to live together in one country. Thank you. 
。首先就是呃，其实，在过去的三十年，我们看到有很多的国家都在讨论转型正义的问题，但是呢，呃，我不会针对特定的国家的状况或者是他们的解决方法来做讨论。我这边想要提出的是一个比较一般性的一个反省，那去看看这些不同的国家他们在处理转型正义的时候，到底遇到的共同困境有哪些？那也因为大部分的国家没有之前这样处理转型正义的经验，也没有先例或者是原则可以直接拿来去套用，因此每个国家他面临的状况情况的确都不一样。但是呢，他们都在想办法，很努力的要找出解决的方案。所以我会觉得，呃。今天我们可以做的是看看这些不同国家他们在处理转型正义的时候有哪一些失败的经验，有哪一些成功的经验，先去借鉴其他国家在这方面的成功失败的做法，我们再来想自己该怎么做。那这边我也想要打一个比方，就是很多时候在追求转型正义的时候，我们遇到一个有点吊诡的情况，那就是就好像今天如果你要去打仗，对一个国家宣战的时候，你最好先想一想，那么如果你赢了之后。接下来会怎么样？因为其实你可以想象，这个战争你会打，通常是觉得自己有打赢的一些胜算，你才会去对别的国家宣战。那今天战争真的结束之后，会有一个国家。胜利国，一个国家是战败国。那么，通常在这个失败的国家当中，战败的国家当中，会有新的政府上台。同时，我们也会看到呢，会有这些人员以及基础建设的破坏、生产设备的破坏，还有当然很多经济上面的损失。换句话说，战后的情况。可以说是一个蛮悲惨的一个呃大灾难的一个状况，因此很多时候战争打赢之后，它可能接下来后续的一个伤害跟影响，比起在打战的这段期间是更大的。也就是说，战后的。胜利有可能反而是一场灾难的开始，所以同样的，今天大家会追求转型正义，就是因为已经有顺利的做到了一个呃政权的一个移转。那么在过去，可能在这种呃某特定的一个政权之下，有一些人遭到了一些不人道、不公正的一个待遇。那现在理论上会追求转型正义，是因为一个更重视公益、更重视人道的政策的政府已经上台了。那么在这样的一个胜利者的姿态之下。下，我们要小心。你在追求转型正义的公正以及人道的时候，是不是有可能反而造成了更大的伤害？因为我们都知道，在很多的人民，他们会希望能够在战后能够去建立自己的生活，他们会支持政府，不是因为他们支持政府的政策，而是希望能够在这个政府的领导之下，他能够去实现自己生活的一个梦想。那所以，今天就算是政权转移了之后，我们不要忘了，所有的人在这个国家。家里面还是必须要彼此尊重，因为我们每一个人还是要在这个国家里面一起生存下去，一起生活下去。所以在处理的方法上，有的时候可能是透过司法的体系，将当初的一些呃。有有有有压迫人权的这些人呢，去绳之以法，但也有其他是找寻和解的一个方式。但是整个的过程其实是非常的复杂。但是我们千万不要忘记，在追求转型正义的同时，我们这个国家每一个人都还是要在这片土地上共同生存下去。Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to join us at the laureate lecture of the 2018 Tan Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science. To begin with, we would like to invite to the stage the host of this lecture, Dr. Xu Qian, University Professor of the University of California, to give us the introduction.
Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Professor Qian. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed my great pleasure and privilege to host this 2018 Town Prize for Biopharmaceutical Science Laureate Lecture this morning. The 2018 Town Prize Laureates in Biopharmaceutical Science. Laureates are Drs. Tony Hunter, Brian Drucker, and John Mendelson for the discovery of protein tyrosine phosphorylation and tyrosine kinases as oncogenes leading to successful targeted cancer therapies. Dr. Tony Hunter made the groundbreaking discovery of protein tyrosine phosphorylation and tyrosine kinases in the late 1970s. This sowed a seed for research in the ensuing 40 years, leading to a thorough understanding of the fundamental principles of cell growth and cancer development, as well as the notion that blockade of tyrosine phosphorylation can be a therapeutic approach for cancer. Dr. Brian Drucker made important contributions in the use of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, TKI, to block tyrosine phosphorylation as a targeted therapy. He led the successful clinical trial of the antibody imantinib or Glivac, which inhibits able tyrosine kinase on chronic myelogenous leukemia. This is a prototype that opened up the field of TKI as targeted therapies, which already have significant impacts on the treatment of cancer patients. For tyrosine kinase to function, it needs to bind to the receptor tyrosine kinase, RTK. The development of antibodies against the extracellular domain of the RTK to prevent the binding of the oncogenic growth factors would be another way to block the tyrosine kinase activation. Dr. John Mendelson used antibodies targeting epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, which is often overexpressed or mutated to become oncogenic. He conducted preclinical research and developed the anti-EGFR antibody, cetuximab, which was approved by FDA in the United States for the treatment of colon and head neck, head neck cancer as the first clinically approved therapy based on RTK targeting antibodies that spurred many others. The development of tyrosine kinase targeted therapies has fundamentally changed the practice of cancer therapy. It provides great benefits to patients who suffer from this dreadful disease and gives hope that cancer can eventually be treated. The superb accomplishments of the three laureates of the 2018 Town Prize in Pharmaceutical Science have made immeasurable contributions to science and society. The achievements, achievements of the three laureates clearly illustrate how brilliant basic science can lead to effective clinical applications that benefit all mankind. We have the great privilege today to hear the three laureate lectures from Drs. Hunter, Dr. Drucker, and uh, Dr. Hong, who is going to speak for Dr. Mandelson. Let's uh, wel welcome the three laureates and with a great round of applause. So uh, I will first make a brief introduction for Dr. Tony Hunter. Uh, Dr. Hunter was born in the United Kingdom and, and now he is a citizen of the United States. He received his uh, BA and PhD from the University of Cambridge and was a research fellow there in the Department of Biochemistry. In 1971, he came to the Salk Institute in San Diego of the United States to become a postdoctoral fellow then he became a faculty 
in molecular and cell biology, becoming a, a full professor and Renato Tobacco Chair in Cancer Research. In 2008 to 2016, he was the director of the Salk Institute Cancer Center. And he is also an adjunct professor in two departments in the, United, uh, in the UCSD in San Diego, in biology and pharmacology. He has received many awards and recognitions, including the Gaidner Foundation International Award, the American Cancer Society Medal of Honor, the uh, Kirk Layden AACR Prize for Basic Cancer Research, the Louisa Gross Horowitz Prize, the uh, Passero Award for Cancer Research, Clifford Prize for Cancer Research, the Royal Medal in Biological Sciences, the Schussberg Prize for Cancer Research, and the, um, most recently, the Peso Color AACR International Award for Extraordinary Achievement in Cancer Research. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of London, uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and National Academy of Medicine, and National Academy uh, the American, Physi American Philosophical Society, as well as the AACR Academy. Uh, as mentioned, he gave birth to the field by discovering tyrosine phosphorylation and showing that the oncogene SARC is a tyrosine kinase. So he has uh, really led a field that uh, allow us to be able to uh, do all the things uh, in the uh, treatment of cancer using this uh, uh, important basic discovery he made. His talk today is entitled, The Tyrosine Phosphorylation from Discovery to Drug Development and Beyond. Let's welcome Dr. Tony Hunter. Good morning, everyone. Let me start by saying what an honor it is to have been selected as one of the 2018 winners of the Tang Prize for Biopharmaceutical Science. I'll start by giving you a brief history of the discovery of uh, tyrosine phosphorylation and then talk about some of our own ongoing uh, work. So the story begins in 1979 I was at the Salk Institute as an assistant professor, and we were working on uh, polyomavirus, a small uh, DNA tumor virus which encodes um, six proteins with the hope that we would learn something about the basis of human cancer. And we and others had shown that one of the three proteins made from the so-called early region, middle T antigen or middle tumor antigen, was responsible for the transforming activity of this virus in cells in, in culture. And this is what I look like, in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> um, I grew my beard at the bottom of the Grand Canyon in 1972. The last day I shaved was June the 21st, 1972. So we had a protein that we knew could cause cancer, but we didn't know how it worked. A year previously, uh, Mark Collette and Ray Erickson had shown that the transforming protein of a second tumor virus, Rous sarcoma virus, called VSARC, had an associated protein kinase activity. And this was an exciting idea that suggested maybe other viruses use protein kinases to transform cells by altering protein activity. And so we tested whether 
Um, the polyoma middle T had such an activity by isolating it in an immunoprecipitate and incubating it with gamma P32 labeled ATP. And in this lane C, you can see that uh, the BAM became heavily P32 labeled. We had mutants of polyomavirus that do not transform, and these mutants here lacked the kinase activity, correlating it with the transforming activity. So we weren't the only people who had this idea, and two other groups, uh, Alan Smith and Mike Fried and Brian Schaffhausen and Tom Benjamin, had also tested this idea and had found that the middle T protein had an associated kinase activity. That summer, there was a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor on uh, tumor viruses, and we all got together, and after giving our talks, decided we would co-submit our papers to Cell when we got back, and we submitted ours on June the 11th, 1979. So we got back the reviews, and this is what they said. These two findings force one to seriously consider the possibility that this is an in vitro artifact. <laughs> the product of this in vitro protein kinase-like reaction was not characterized, and with the very low activity, um, it might be the result of some contaminant. And the third review was, unfortunately, very few of these conclusions drawn by the authors are actually clearly substantiated by the data. So you would have thought the paper would now be rejected out of hand, never to see the light of day. But the editor of Cell at the time was Ben Lewin, and he was an autocrat, if you like, and he decided he liked these papers and wanted them to be published. So one of the criticisms was that we hadn't characterized the activity, and I already knew that this was a likely criticism, and so the day after... I seem to be now... Yes, yeah, so you can't read this, I know. But the day after we submitted, on the 12th of June, 1979, I set out to find which amino acid was phosphorylated by taking some of the labeled band, hydrolyzing it in acid, and separating it on a thin layer plate by electrophoresis at pH 1.9. Uh, and if you could read it, that's what this says. Um, so the plate, after separation, was exposed to an X-ray film together with stained markers for phosphoserine and phosphothreonine, the only two known phosphoamino acids, and this was the result of an overnight exposure. Now, you, you might look at this and see nothing, but in fact, with the eye of faith, there is a weak spot here. <laughs> and uh, with a longer exposure, you can actually see that this spot migrates between phosphoserine and phosphothreonine. So this suggested there was some new product of this kinase reaction that was acid stable. And so I said I've something like, you know, clearly this is not phosphoserine or phosphoserine. So it could have been an artifact, but I repeated the experiment uh, a few days later and got the same result. So since this was stable to acid hydrolysis, it probably was a phosphate ester linkage. And um, the most logical possibility was tyrosine, which was the only other hydroxy amino acid that I had uh, learned in my days in the biochemistry department. So serine and threonine are phosphorylated on the beta hydroxyl group. Uh, tyrosine has a phenolic hydroxyl group, so it's very different in, in one sense. So to test whether this new spot was phosphotyrosine, I tried to make some phosphotyrosine by incubating tyrosine with phosphorus, phosphorus oxychloride and discovered this goes, gives you a black tar. Uh, I'm no chemist, as you can realize, but in the end, I did, I did purify a little uh, phosphotyrosine, and in fact, the spot um, co-migrated with the radioactivity. So, on the verge of something important, I decided to go and raft a river in Idaho. And on July the 3rd, a group of us drove up to the Salmon River in Idaho. And here I am, <laughs> rowing my boat down the uh, Salmon River in Idaho. Didn't get back for a whole month, in fact. When we got back, um, I realized I needed a better separation for phosphotyrosine and 
uh, establish this two-dimensional system, which clearly shows that the radioactivity from middle T co-migrates with tyrosine and not uh, osteocerine or phosphatrine. So we resubmitted the paper to Cell with these new data in it um, on September the 25th. It was accepted on September the 27th. This means that it was not re-reviewed, and this was Ben Lewin's decision. Uh, the other two papers from the other groups were also resubmitted, but they did not or had not been asked to um, identify the phosphor amino acid. And so these papers were all published in December of 1979. So in retrospect, the reason why I had discovered phosphotyrosine was that I had been too lazy to make up a fresh buffer. And the pH 1.9 buffer I had used many times before changes pH and drops to pH 1.7. And this allows phosphotyrosine to resolve from phosphotrini. Turns out the uh, activity of uh, middle T is not intrinsic, but it's due to an associated protein kinase that Sarah Courtney showed was the product of the CSARC gene. So in the course of doing those studies, I realized that I ought to try another method of isolating phosphotyrosine from the labeled middle T and carried out a complete protease um, treatment to release amino acids and ran that sample out and you can see the band or the spot co-migrates with phosphotyrosine. But at the same time, we were working on the Rastacoma virus VSARC protein kinase and so I thought I'd just include that as a control. In this case, the VSARC protein phosphorylates the heavy chain of the precipitating antibody. And when I ran out that hydrolysis, much to my amazement, it turned out that this was phosphotyrosine and not phosphotrenine as had been reported by Erickson and Collette. So that was done on September the 18th, 1979. So this autoradiogram and the thin layer plate uh, from which it was derived are now on exhibit as part of the Tang Prize uh, show um, in the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall. So this, it, from this, it looked like SARC was also going to be a, well, a tyrosine kinase. And uh, here is additional evidence that this is phosphorylating tyrosine. And more importantly, we were able to show that chick cells transformed by the VSARC protein had elevated levels of phosphotyrosine in cellular proteins based on this two-dimensional separation showing a small amount of phosphotyrosine in the uninfected chick cells and about a tenfold increase in the transformed chick cells. So we submitted a paper describing this tyrosine kinase activity of VSARC to uh, PNAS, and these reviews were a lot kinder. Uh, these findings are both interesting and potentially extremely significant in that phosphorylation of tyrosine has never been reported. The primary significance of this work derives from the fact that the phosphorylation of tyrosine is such a novel activity. And finally, a handwritten review saying, no revisions necessary, publish as is. So, this paper was communicated to PNAS by Bob Holly and appeared um, in March of, of 1980. So amazingly, all the experiments, starting with the first experiment on the polyomavirus kinase activity to the uh, studies of the VSARC protein, took less than five months. And all of the experiments in the VSARC tyrosine kinase paper were done in less than a month. If anyone's interested in the history, here's a, a review I wrote a, a couple of years ago. So, so by now, I was really interested in protein kinases. And so at about the same time, the first sequences, both protein sequences and DNA sequences of proteins with protein kinase activity began to appear, starting with the sequence of the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase down here. And here's um, the sequence of the VSARC tyrosine kinase. And I began to align these sequences to see if they were related to one another. This was done by I. So BB here stands for before blast. 
And it turns out that the human eye is very good at aligning sequences. And you could see all of these kinase sequences had these related motifs along the length of the catalytic domain. And it turns out these motifs are conserved in all of the eukaryotic protein kinases and are used as a, a hallmark of a, of a protein kinase when a new sequence is obtained. The first um, report of these sequence alignments didn't appear, appear in a regular journal, but instead appeared in the Scientific American, where I wrote an article on the proteins of uh, oncogenes. So by using these uh, sequence motifs, these catalytic motifs, it, it began to be clear there would be a very large number of protein kinase uh, genes in, in a single genome based on the rate of appearance of new reported kinases. And so at the time, I somewhat rashly uh, predicted there might be as many as 1,001 uh, protein kinases. When the human genome was completely sequenced in 2002, we could actually deduce how many protein kinases there are. And it turned out there were 478 protein kinase genes in the human genome closely related to um, that original alignment I showed you, um, as well as a few atypical protein kinases, many very distantly related, including the PI kinase-like kinases, ATM, ATR, mTOR, and, and DNA PK. Interestingly, about 10% of these kinases are predicted to lack catalytic activity because they're missing one or more of the motifs. And these have become known as uh, pseudokinases. Many of these have important scaffolding functions. Fast forward another 16 years, and we, and particularly Pryor's group, have been able to identify some additional protein kinases in the human genome. And the number stands now at around 535. Not quite 1,001, but not so far off. All of the new protein kinases are remote or atypical protein kinases, and I'll briefly tell you about some work we've been doing on the enemy family of histidine kinases. So how many tyrosine kinases are there? So we had one in 1979. By the end of 1980, there were four, including three new viral tyrosine kinases and the EGF receptor um, that John Mendelssohn worked on. And when the complete human genome sequence was reported, it turned out there are 90 tyrosine kinases. And you can see them here in the tyrosine kinase branch of the tree. Over half of those are implicated in disease, and particularly in cancer. And it became clear from surveying the literature that mutations in protein kinases would be causal in a fairly large number of diseases, uh, and particularly in cancer. And this led to a lot of interest in, by pharma and academia, actually, in developing small molecule inhibitors of particularly tyrosine kinases as possible therapeutics. And as of a month or so ago, there are now 45 approved kinase inhibitors, uh, 32 of which are TKIs or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And I don't suppose you can see this, but starting over here um, with imatinib or Gleevec that, that Brian will describe to you, you can see there's just been a steady uh, increase in the number of kinase inhibitors. And there are many, many more in clinical trials. So imatinib was the first targeted cancer therapeutic. And now we have a whole collection of kinase inhibitors that target other kinases and other cancers. So with that introduction, let me now turn to the, uh, the two uh, ongoing research projects in the lab. First one is a more translational project to try and develop better therapeutic treatments for uh, pancreatic cancer, one of the most devastating cancers, largely because it's usually diagnosed so late. Pancreatic cancer uh, shows a progression of uh, phenotypes and morphologies. And, where, and characteristic genetic changes, including a KRAS activating mutation, loss of a CDK inhibitor, and P53 and SMAD for loss of function mutations. 
and the disease goes through these morphological features called panins. Ultimately, the cancer, which is in situ, becomes invasive and begins to migrate through adjacent tissue and then potentially into the bloodstream to establish metastases, usually in the liver. So I should remind you that solid tumors aren't, don't just consist of tumor cells. They also contain stromal cells of various sorts, including blood vessels, immune cells, and cancer-associated fibroblasts. And particularly in this case, a specialized uh, stromal cell called the stellate cell. Stellate cells are resident cells in the pancreatic, uh, in pancreatic tissue. They have a star-like shape, hence their name. These cells are activated in response to inflammation or the formation of a tumor. They are highly secre secretory cells and they pump out extracellular matrix proteins as well as a large number of cytokines. And they are responsible for forming a dense stromal matrix around uh, uh, nests of, of tumor cells as an, in an attempt to wall off the, the tumor cells. So Yushi, a postdoc in the lab, became interested in whether proteins secreted by the activated stellate cells, particularly cytokines, could act as a stimulus to the tumor cells to promote um, their proliferation and survival. And we thought that paracrine factors of this sort might make uh, good um, targets. And I'm going to focus on uh, a protein secreted by the activated stellate cells called leukemia inhibitory factor. It's a cytokine uh, in, the, in the IL-6 family. So our initial approach was to carry out an analysis of all the secreted proteins from both uh, tumor cells and uh, a stellate cell line using mass spec. These secretomes, as we call them, are very complicated with over 2,000 proteins secreted by the tumor cells and 1,400 by the stellate cells. And we focused on proteins that were unique either to the tumor cells or to the stellate cells. And you get a long list and you have to choose something to prioritize. And so we chose leukemia inhibitory factor because it appeared to be unique to the stellate cells and has interesting stem cell properties. And just note, in addition, that the stellate cells make a lot of extracellular matrix proteins as we already had expected. So why do we focus on LIV? Um, we knew that pancreatic stellate cell condition medium can stimulate the phosphorylation of STAT3, which is a, a LIV target. And we could show that antibodies to LIV neutralize this activity. We identified um, the LIV receptor as being um, bound to a protein in the stellate cell condition medium. And we showed that the stellate cell secretome has high lift levels. And I'll just show you that here indeed by an ELISA assay, the stellate cells have a lot of, um, a lot of, of lift. We had used Miapaca tumor cells. They have very low levels of lift. But you can see there are tumor cells that also make lift, and so lift it's very high in pancreatic tissue, as I'll show you, and it may be produced by both the stromal cells and the tumor cells. So LIF, or leukemia inhibitory factor, is a stem cell factor. Some of you in the audience may use LIF to maintain the pluripotency of ES cells grown in culture. And so we thought it was interesting from that perspective. Perhaps it was uh, activating stem cell-like cells in some of the tumor cells. As I said, LIF is a member of the uh, IL-6 family. They, they all use a common signaling subunit called GP130, and then they have a specialized ligand binding subunit. And so each of these receptors, while signaling through a, a, the same uh, subunit, all bind to distinct heterodimers. And the major signaling pathway activated by LIF and IL-6 is the JAK-STAT pathway. Uh, coincidentally, JAK is a tyrosine kinase and phosphorylates a tyrosine in the STAT transcription factor, leading to its dimerization. 
uh, migration into the nucleus where it activates expression of um, stem cell genes like uh, SOX2 and OCT4. So having shown that there's a high level of LIF uh, expressed in, in pancreatic uh, tumor tissue, we wanted to know whether this is actually important as a driver of pancreatic cancer. And so we used the mouse model developed by David Tuberson called the KPC model in which PDX1 CRE, which is expressed during the development of the pancreas, uh, activates expression of a G12DKRAS um, mutant gene, and at the same time uh, deletes both copies of the P53 tumor suppressor gene. This is a very aggressive model, and you can see that the mice die on average of around 50 days after birth with a fulminant pancreatic cancer. So we established a, a preclinical model to test whether neutralizing LIF with a, a neutralizing antibody called D25 affected the progression of the disease. We could show that uh, treatment of KPC mice uh, reduced phosphostat-3 staining um, in the tumor, and you can't really see this here, but if you look here, you can see there are nests of tumor cells with no nuclear phosphostat-3 um, staining, but there are still some cells that are phosphostat-3 positive. So we set up a preclinical trial in which we use the combination of gemcitabine, a nucleoside analog that is um, currently used in pancreatic cancer therapy and uh, the anti-LIF monoclonal antibody at 25 mg per kg, administered two or three times a week. And uh, we found that uh, a combination of gemcitabine and anti-LIF antibody uh, gave you a significant increase in survival of these mice. So, so that was certainly encouraging that LIF is in fact contributing to um, tumor progression. We also found that we pre-treated the mice with a combination, a triple chemo com combination that's currently used in, in human therapy, NAB, paclitaxel, a, a microtubule poison, cisplatin, and gemcitabine, followed by anti-LIF antibody. We now get a significant increase in, in survival, and this is really the way it might be used in the, in the clinic. We could show that uh, lift depletion led to a reduction in the number of cells in the tumor with stem cell-like properties. For instance, here is re-implanting cells, purified tumor cells, back into the flank. And you can see if you treat, pre-treat the mice with anti-LIF antibody, very few cells can now form a new tumor. We also found that anti-LIF antibody treatment resulted in a significant increase in the fraction of the tumor tissue that was differentiated according to um, three independent pathologists. We also used a genetic model to eliminate um, expression of the LIF receptor in the epithelial cells, i.e. in the tumor cells. In situ hybridization using RNA scope showed that um, LIF itself is expressed primarily in the stromal cells surrounding the tumor cells, although there are positive tumor cells, whereas the LIF receptor in red here is expressed exclusively in the tumor cells. And what we found was that when we conditionally knocked out the LIF receptor in the pancreas, um, there was also a significant increase in survival, particularly in the presence of gemcitabine, suggesting that the LIF target is the LIF receptor in the tumor cells. So we could also show now, looking at a, a time course of progression, that LIF levels increase steadily in the KPC mice over time, and that we can detect uh, LIF protein in the serum of these KPC mice suggesting it might be used as a biomarker. Of course, all of this was done in mice, so what about people? If we look at uh, tumor tissue using a, a LIF ELISA assay, we can see there are elevated levels of LIF in, in the tumor samples, much higher levels than IL-6, it turns out. And we can also detect um, high LIF levels in the serum of pancreatic 
uh, tumor patients. If we analyze those patients in a little more detail, we can see that the levels of lift correlate with the disease status, and there is a trend towards a correlation with longer survival with patients who have low uh, lift levels. So to summarize this section then, we've shown that a, a neutralizing anti-lift antibody prolongs survival in a mouse model. Lift levels are Lift levels, can you refix this? Uh, thanks. Lift levels are correlated uh, with disease status. And obviously, the next step would be to develop a humanized anti lift antibody to test in, in clinical trials. And Northern Biologics, with whom I have no financial interest, uh, in Toronto has developed such a humanized antibody, and it began trials in August in highly refractory cancers, including pancreatic cancers. So hopefully in the next few months, we'll see whether uh, the LIF antibody does have any palliative effect on pancreatic cancer. So in the last few minutes, then, let me uh, turn to a second topic. So 40 years ago, this is the reaction that I discovered. Tyrosine is phosphorylated on the phenolic hydroxyl group, generating a phosphate ester, a very heat-stable and acid-stable linkage. But it turns out that in addition to tyrosine, not only serine and threonine, but also six other amino acids can be phosphorylated. Most people don't even realize this. They include the three basic amino acids, cysteine, glutamate, and aspartate. Very little is known about these. Um, but histidine sparked our interest because it is a ring-like structure, very like tyrosine, and it was already known that it could be phosphorylated. Interestingly, histidine can be phosphorylated um, either on the N1 to form a phosphoramidate, a phosphorus nitrogen linkage, or the three position. So you have two isoforms of phosphohistidine. Both of these are chemically very unstable uh, at any pH below seven or when you heat the samples. Histidine phosphorylation is best understood in um, bacterial systems where the two component signaling pathways use histidine phosphorylation to transmit a signal across the plasma membrane. And the surface receptor autophosphorylates on a histidine, and this phosphate is then transferred to an aspartate uh, to generate the signal. But phosphohistidine is also known in mammalian cells. There are metabolic enzymes such as phosphoglycerate mutase and uh, ATP citrate lyase that use a phosphohistidine intermediate. But there are also proteins that are simply modified on histidine, uh, such as histone uh, H4. The only enzymes we know that can phosphorylate histidine are NME1 and NME2, also known as NDPK and B. These are actually nucleoside diphosphate kinases. They're housekeeping enzymes which rephosphorylate nucleoside diphosphates like GDP with uh, ATP. But these enzymes use a one phosphohistidine intermediate, and that phosphate can also be transferred onto proteins, onto histidine residues. We've learned that histidine phosphorylation in mammalian cells regulates many different sorts of processes in different parts of the cell, including surface uh, proteins, ion channels, uh, at the mitochondria, um, and also in the nucleus where histone H4 is phosphorylated. To summarize what we know, in the bacteria, uh, there are these two component systems that carry out a phosphohistidine phosphoaspartate relay. In mammalian cells, we have uh, histidine kinases, NME1 and NME2, that use the enzyme intermediate to phosphorylate proteins. There are uh, at least three phosphohistidine phosphatases that can remove the phosphate, making this a, a, a reversible phosphorylation process, just like tyrosine phosphorylation. In a few cases, we know what the phosphorylation on histidine does. In this case, phosphorylation of this histidine in the tail of a potassium channel increases uh, channel opening. 
So in the case of tyrosine phosphorylation, antiphosphotyrosine antibodies have been incredibly useful in studying this process. And we were attracted by the idea that because phosphohistidine is also a ring structure, we might be able to make antibodies to it for a similar purpose. We had tried this 25 years ago, but failed, probably because the phosphohistidine we used was too chemically unstable. And so we needed a stable analog, and Tom Muir's group developed these phosphoryl triazolyl alanine analogs where the phosphorus is linked to a five-member ring like histidine via a phosphorus carbon bond that's totally stable. And there are two analogs, one PTZA and three PTZA. And we incorporated these analogs into a random allogly peptide backbone, coupled this to KLH to immunize rabbits. And much to our delight, we uh, obtained antibodies that were specific for the isoform. So here is NME1. It's a 1p his intermediate detected by the 1p his antibodies. Postoglycerate mutase is a 3p his intermediate not detected, and vice versa, the 3p his antibodies only detect postoglycerate mutase. And when we heat the samples prior to running on the gel, these are all blots, by the way, um, the signal goes away. So we use these antibodies to um, generate, or use the rabbits to generate monoclonal antibodies, both to the 1p his and 3p his forms. And here are a series of pancreatic cancer cell lines, in each case uh, blotted with an unheated, con uh, unheated sample and a heated control. The major bands are NME1 and NME2, the enzyme intermediates themselves, but there are other bands that go away with heating. And in the case of the three PHIS antibodies, both E. coli and 293 cells show a, a lot of um, bands that disappear with, with heating. So we think three PHIS may be the major uh, type of histidine phosphorylation in cells. So we now have three unique 1 PHIS monoclonal antibodies and three unique, uh, four unique three PHIS monoclonal antibodies that are available. We've used these antibodies for immunostaining. So here are staining of uh, HeLa cells with a 3 PHIS antibody. You can see nuclear green staining, a sort of a dotted pattern. Uh, and these two dots here turn out to be the centrosomes, uh, which, like the spindle pole, poles, stain positive for phosphohistidine, suggesting that um, Histidine phosphorylation might be important in progression through the cell cycle and mitosis. We've used the antibodies to isolate phosphohistidine proteins from cells to see what the global phosphohistidine proteome looks like. Are we able to isolate around 800 proteins that contain phosphohistidine? Many of these proteins are involved in RNA metabolism. A significant number in the cell cycle, as we might have expected. And we found many proteins we knew were reported to contain uh, phosphohistidine. So additional work that I, I won't show you has indicated that, um, or maybe it's here, yes. There are a lot, going to be a lot of additional phosphohistidine-containing proteins. And our estimate, and Claire Ayer's estimate, is that about 25% of all phosphate linked to protein in a mammalian cell, a HeLa cell, for instance, is linked to histidine, lysine, or arginine. And so there's a very large hidden phosphoproteome that we know almost nothing about that's probably going to be very important. So the obvious question is, what does histidine phosphorylation do? Is it used for short-term responses because it's chemically unstable? Are there phosphohistidine-specific binding domains like the SH2 domains for phosphotyrosine? Is it simply working through a very large charge change, plus one to minus two? Or can it regulate divalent methyl ion binding, as we have shown in the case of that potassium channel? So I'll just finish then with one sort of more translational discovery we've made in collaboration with Mike Hall and his postdoc, Sravanth Hindupur, in a cancer model. Uh, so Mike Hall has generated a, uh, a mouse in which M mTORC1 is activated by TSC1 conditional knockout and mTORC2 by conditional P10 knockout. And these mice develop a very rapid hepatocellular carcinoma. 
And they investigated by proteomic analysis which kinases and phosphatases had altered expression in the tumors. And they found that the most highly upregulated kinases were the NME1 and NME2 proteins. And the most highly downregulated phosphatase was LHPP, a phospholysine phosphohistidine phosphatase. So we collaborated with them to show that tumors from these mice have elevated levels of 3-phosphohistidine as well as elevated levels of phospho NME1 and NME2. It's a two to three-fold increase here. Um, to test whether LHPP was really responsible for dephosphorylating histidine in cells, it was expressed in a cell line from one of these tumors via an adenovirus vector, and this significantly decreases the level of um, phosphohistidine. And in vivo, re-expression of LHPP via injection of an AAV vector into the tail vein, which takes it to the liver, caused a dramatic decrease in the number and size of tumors in, um, in these mice. Of course, again, that was mice. What about humans? Well, Mike has a collaboration with clinical oncologists in Basel. And uh, in these two patients, you can see that um, their tumor tissue has very high levels of 3-phosphohistidine um, compared to normal uh, surrounding liver tissue. So what we would conclude is then that histidine phosphorylation is playing a driver role in, in liver cancer and that the LHPP phosphatase is a tumor suppressor which um, is down-regulated in these hepatocellular uh, carcinomas. So that leads to the question of how histidine phosphorylation is working and whether one might be able to develop uh, drugs that uh, antagonize this increased histidine phosphorylation. So let me finish then by just reminding uh, particularly the students in the audience, how long progress in science can take. So the discovery of CML that Brian will talk about was back in, in 1845, and it took till 2001 through a series of discoveries like the uh, SARC tyrosine kinase, the ABLE tyrosine kinase, uh, to develop a drug that antagonizes BCR ABLE and, and uh, acts as sort of a miracle drug for, uh, for CML. Let me then thank the people who did the work in, in the lab. Um, targeting LIF from stellate cells in pancreatic cancer was spearheaded by Yu Shi in the lab with a collaboration from Ruijun Tian, who was a postdoc in Tony Forson's lab and is now um, running a lab at uh, SUSTEC in, uh, in Shenzhen. And the work on the phosphohistine antibodies really was driven by Steve Foos from help from other people in the lab. Finally, let me thank the old buffer uh, and the work on phosphotyrosine with my colleagues at the SOC, Walter Eckhart, Bart Sefton, and Marianne Hutchinson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunter, for your marvelous lecture on tyrosine phosphorylation and also the exciting new work on histidine phosphorylation. Thank you very, very much. Now I'll give a brief introduction for our, oh, our next laureate, Dr. Brian Drucker. Uh, Dr. Drucker received his uh, bachelor and MD degree from UC San Diego, and then he went to Boston. Uh, until 1993 when he joined Oregon Health Science University uh, as a staff physician with a joint appointment in the Department of Cellular and Development Biology. Now he is a professor of medicine and director of the Oregon Health Science University Cancer Institute. He uh, has received many recognitions and awards. He is a member of National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, American Association of Physicians, American Society for Clinical Investigation, and investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He has received a Medal of Honor from American Cancer Society, the Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award, the Meyerberg 
Price, the AACR Richard and Hinda Rudenthal Foundation Award, and the Japan Prize. As already been mentioned, he has made outstanding contributions in the development and application of the TKI, uh, Gleevec, which was the first successful example of tyrosine kinase targeted therapy by small molecule inhibitors. Let us welcome Dr. Drucker to the, give the, his lecture. Looks good, thank you. Thank you, it is an honor to be here and to be honored with the Tang Prize in 2018. <laughs> with my colleague, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Mendelssohn. Um, I'm gonna take a slightly different approach than, than Dr. Hunter, not being quite the scientist that he is. Um, and, but I also wanna, uh, continue on the theme that he talked about, which is about the amount of time that it takes for a breakthrough. And so part of what I want to do is, sort of, is to take you through what I'll subtitle um, the anatomy of a breakthrough. And so really what I'm trying to, 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 to share with you is why is it that I'm here on this stage as opposed to somebody else? Or why couldn't this be you in five years or 10 years or 20 years? And so I'll start with the concept that Dr. Hunter talked about, which is that breakthroughs take time. And so to illustrate that for you, I want to take you back about a century. I'll take you back a century and have you go and visit with a doctor. And when you go to visit this doctor, you've been diagnosed with a common infection. And this is what your encounter is going to look like when you go to see that doctor. disease, an infection just like any other. I've seen cases where it was transmitted by an inanimate object. You mustn't be this hardened. How many as badly off as you? Many. You like it well. You must come here twice weekly for sweat baths, observation, and medical supplies. The treatment consists largely in rubbing yourself with this ointment. Tell me, Doctor, will I get well? Rub a different part of the skin every night of the week so that no part of the skin is rubbed more than once weekly. There is a girl in Munich, whom I'm in love, who loves me. We had planned to be married as soon as I graduate. Tell me, Doctor. Tell me the truth. Can we ever get married now? I'm afraid marriage is out of the question, Hans. You may dress now. Does anybody ever get cured? Of course. There have been many cures, many. <laughs> yes, many cures. And the reality is if you went to the doctor in the early 1900s with an infection, that was a lethal disease. And if you go back into the 1900s, the leading cause of death in Taiwan in the United States were infectious diseases, pneumonia, tuberculosis, diarrheal diseases, Cancer isn't even in the top five on this list. But if you fast forward now a century, heart disease is the number one killer in most countries. Cancer is close on its heels. 
and in the United States certainly will overtake heart disease within the next decade or two. But infectious disease has been relegated to largely eradicated, treatable, or cured. So one could evaluate what was it over the course of the last century that allowed infections to be cured or eradicated. And it truly was a broad-based approach. Early in the 1900s, most countries began sewage and wastewater treatments. By the middle of the century, we had refrigerators in most homes. These were the public health measures that made our food and water supply safe. In the early 1900s, I told you you could target bacteria specifically with drugs called antibiotics, you would have sent a review like the one that was sent to Dr. Hunter in your paper saying that's ridiculous. But by the 1940s, 1950s, antibiotics came along and began to treat common infections. And in the 1950s, the polio vaccine, and now numerous vaccinations for polio, smallpox, mumps, measles, and many, many others. But if you cast these as broad categories, that would be prevention, specific treatments or targeted therapies, and modulating the immune system. So quite a broad-based approach over the course of the century to make infectious diseases treatable or eradicated. Dr. Hunter showed you this general timeline of the disease I worked on called chronic myeloid leukemia. And again, a lengthy history of breakthroughs and discoveries, beginning with the first clinical description of the disease in 1845, the identification of B. cerebrals that caused it a molecular abnormality, and then ultimately specific therapy for chronic myeloid leukemia. If you look at the clinical description, first described 1845, on the left by Virchow and on the right by Bennett. I'm sorry, I've got that right. On the left by Bennett, on the right by Virchow. These two manuscripts were published in 1845. Now, it's said that Bennett published his description six weeks earlier than Virchow. Now, think back, 1845, there wasn't exactly a computer. There were not really even typewriters. These manuscripts were hand set and printed. And can you imagine even how the reviews were done without a reliable postal system? Nonetheless, there insert, ensued a vigorous debate about who was really first. And ultimately, Virchow capitulated that Bennett had described his six weeks prior, so Bennett gets priority. So another lesson to learn is debates about who was first in science go back a long, long ways. Now fast forward about 150 years, we now know that chronic myeloid leukemia is one of the four common types of leukemia, making up about 15 to 20 percent of all leukemias. The incidence is pretty flat worldwide, affecting about one to two people per 100,000 per year. The disease can affect any age group, but the average age of onset is about middle age, 50 to 60. And historically, the median survival was three to five years. So second precept, when you think about a breakthrough, is a breakthrough requires knowledge. So let's go back and visit our doctor in his clinic and see what he has to say about that. The germ of syphilis has been discovered. Really? By, no. by whom? By one uh, Fritz Schaudin. The German medical weekly sent me these proofs for approval. Listen. The spirochete of pallida is a protozoan. It is a fine, steeply convoluted filament with six to 14 turns. It is decidedly motile, with forward turning and bending movements. 
Tell me, does that description put you in mind of anything else? It is decidedly mortal, with forward, turning, and bending movements. Why, that's just like the trypanosome. Right. If the germ has been discovered, there's cause to hope for a cure. Yes, there is hope. So there we have it. If the cause has been discovered, there's hope for a cure. So as I'm talking about chronic myeloid leukemia, you're free to think about whatever disease you happen to be working on and can follow that same logic. So we need to understand what causes CML. And we'll start in 1960 with Peter Knoll and David Hungerford, who working in Philadelphia identified an abnormal chromosome in the blood and bone marrow of patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. And in 1960, they published this landmark paper in Science. This is the entire paper, three paragraphs. So yes, that's right, quality and quantity do not equate. But as you often do in the last paragraph of your paper, you think about the broad implications of your work. And what they said was the findings suggest a causal relationship between the chromosome abnormality observed and chronic granulocytic or chronic myeloid leukemia. As most scientists are skeptical, the general community thought that they were absolutely wrong about that. It turns out they were absolutely right and way ahead of their time. In 1973, Janet Rowley, working at the University of Chicago, showed that it was thought to be a shortened chromosome 22, the so-called Philadelphia chromosome, actually came about because of a reciprocal translocation between the long arms of chromosome 9 and 22, creating a shortened chromosome 22 and an elongated chromosome 9. By the 1980s, when individuals were mapping chromos or oncogenes to chromosome locations, it became clear that what happened as a result of this chromosome translocation was that the able tyrosine kinase located on chromosome 9 was translocated in its entirety to chromosome 22 creating a fusion gene and protein called BCR ABLE. And I'd point out that today is 922, and here we have the 922 translocation, and today is World CML Day. <laughs> <laughs> the next precept to think about a breakthrough is that breakthroughs often occur when different fields of investigation converge. But it's also, you have to apply the right technology at the right time. As you heard from Dr. Hunter, when he was beginning his career, sequencing an individual gene was a Herculean task. By the time he described 500 different kinases, we could sequence an entire genome. But let me take you through this timeline, so which Dr. Hunter has covered quite eloquently. So out of tumor virology came the oncogenes B. Sark and Abel. I take you through chromosome banding and chromosome analysis, which led to the discovery of B-Cerebral. And of course, the entire field of protein phosphorylation with Dr. Hunter's seminal finding in 1979 of tyrosine kinases with the identification of VSARC and ABL. All of this led to the notion that someday you could produce a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So the last precept I'll cover is that breakthroughs require seeing things differently. And oftentimes when people give lectures like this, they'll say, you've got to think outside the box. Well, what I'm going to tell you is sometimes you've got to see the box and call it a box, because the answer may be right in front of you, staring you in the face. And I can now add yet another example from Dr. Hunter's work where he could have discarded that, that that gel that showed phosphotyrosine, but he took a deeper look. And I'll give you several other examples where individuals looked at something right in front of them and discovered something remarkable. I'll start with Velcro. Well, use Velcro in our daily lives, but the history of Velcro was this George de Mistral, a Swiss engineer, went out for a hike in the Swiss Alps one day wearing a velvet vest. And he came back from his hike, and his vest was covered with burrs. Now, like most people who've gone on hikes with their clothes covered with burrs, you pick them off, your finger gets pricked, and you swear at the burr, and you go on with your day. 
Well, he asked this important question. He asked, why do these burrs stick so tightly to my velvet vest? Happens that he had a microscope down in his basement. He went and looked and found that his velvet vest had loops and the burrs had hooks. And he said, I bet I could make a fastener out of that. So like many before him, he was the first to ask the important question of why. I'll give you a medical example, penicillin, Alexander Fleming. The story goes that Alexander Fleming went into the lab one day, looked at a plate of bacteria that got contaminated with yeast and saw that the bacteria weren't growing very well around the yeast. And instead of throwing away those contaminated plates like many before and thousands and thousands after him would have done, he again asked the question, why are these bacterial growth inhibited? and he discovered penicillin. But what people don't realize, people think that was a chance finding. But the reality is Sir Alexander Fleming was a physician, and he had done training during World War I, and he grew frustrated by removing bullets from wounded soldiers, only to have them die two or three weeks later of an infection. So he dedicated his career to finding compounds that could inhibit the growth of bacteria. Twelve years later was that fateful day that he walked into the lab. So was that an accident? Was that a prepared mind? It really doesn't matter. He went and asked the important question, why? So I came to the field of CML in 1988 to 1990, and here's what was known. B. cerebral, the product of the Philadelphia chromosome, present in virtually every single patient with CML, it was thought to be, at least in my mind, the cause of molecular abnormality, although at the time it was debated. And we knew that B. cerebral functioned as an activated kinase. And one of the early experiments I did in, in the lab was to knock out the kinase activity and show that it no longer functioned as a transforming oncogene. So if you think about this schematically, Tyrosine kinases transfer phosphate onto tyrosine residues, specific substrate proteins, and it's these substrate proteins that cause all the abnormal proliferation that you see in patients with CML. So in my mind, I thought if you could block binding of ATP to this specific tyrosine kinase, you could have an ideal therapeutic approach. So in 1993, when I moved to Oregon, my colleague at Sibagaygi, Nick Leiden, send me a handful of compounds, including this one, STI-571, or Gleave, it ultimately became Gleevec. And what our lab showed was this was the best compound at inhibiting the growth of CML cells, both in vitro and in vivo and animal models, as well as eliminating CML cells from patients with the disease. But the problem was there were lots and lots of reasons this drug never should have been developed. The first hurdle, which actually was even getting a drug company to work on this, is that somebody had predicted there was going to be a thousand kinases in the kinome. It was Tony Hunter. And what drug companies thought was if you go back here, if all these kinases bind ATP, if you block one at the ATP binding site, you're going to block them all. So the view was there will never be able to get a specific kinase inhibitor. So the general view was you cannot make drugs against this target. Oncologists are incredibly skeptical. And the view was there has never been a single drug that works against cancer in its history. Why on earth would a single drug for CML work? And then the problem also was that some of the early knockouts of tyrosine kinases, PDGF receptor, EGF receptor, were embryonic lethal. And so the view was even if you had specificity, these are going to be incredibly toxic. And if you didn't have specificity, they were going to be horrendously toxic. But the biggest hurdle was they're never going to make any money. And so imagine you're a big drug company, and your marketers are looking at the market for patients with CML, 5,000 new cases a year in the United States, 5,000 in Europe, and probably a, a couple hundred in Taiwan. So you look at the market, 
and you say it's going to cost us a billion dollars to develop this drug. The drug is going to have a 1 in 10 chance of success. And if the market penetration is about 30% in the first year, we may make 100 million a year. So is there anyone who wants to invest a billion dollars with a 1 in 10 chance of success with the ability to make 100 million a year? I'm probably not going to get many takers on that. And that was ultimately the calculations that were done and was the biggest hurdle. But the reality is there were lots of patients in my own clinic that needed this. And fortunately, I was able to convince the company to go to clinical trials. And this is one of the earliest patients we put on. And it's often said you only need one patient to tell you that you have an effective drug. And so this is the before and after picture. The numbers on the left are the patient's white blood count. 10,000 is a normal white blood count. And I used to treat this patient with an old drug called Hydrea, and his blood counts would rise. I'd raise his Hydrea dose. When his blood counts would lower, I'd lower his Hydrea dose, and his white count would bounce back up. Now, his wife, who's an accountant, loves numbers, would keep track of me. When his, her husband's white count would go up, she'd say, Dr. Druk, you're not doing very well at controlling my husband's blood counts, are you? And I would say sheepishly, ma'am, I'm doing the best I can. I'd raise his dose and I'd usually overshoot. In April of 1999, he was started on 300 milligrams a day of Gleevec. And by December of that year, his wife finally said, Dr. Druk, you're actually doing a pretty good job. I'm going to stop checking on you. <laughs> now, of course, the FDA doesn't like anecdotes. This was our five year now survival data. And you can see we have a 90% survival with imatinib or Gleevec at five years. So remember, previously, survival had been three to five years. In 2001, this drug received the fastest FDA approval in the history of the FDA and appeared on the cover of Time magazine. So let me have you introduce you to one of my patients. Oh, I'm sorry, one more. One, in our 10-year follow-up, we published this manuscript in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in patients in this column called Major Molecular Response, which is a deep, a three-log response, look at these remarkable data. 100% of patients with a major molecular response or a deep response will survive 10 years without dying from CML. Now, the reality is not everybody survived. They died of other causes. But no patients with this response have died of CML, but a truly remarkable finding. So now let me introduce you to one of my patients. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie, and I'm very excited to be here tonight. I'm going to start out by telling you all a little bit about myself. I'm 18 years old. I'm a nursing student at University of Portland. I graduated in the top 8% of my high school class. I was, thank you. I was part of the Royal Crown's dance team where I was team captain, all state athlete, and state champion. I love my dogs, Italian food, and Grey's Anatomy. And when I was six years old, I was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia. We all know what happens in the treatment for cancer, chemo and radiation, hair loss and nausea, but would you like to know a secret? I never had any of that. I had Gleevec. Because of Brian Drucker, my life is as I described it to you. Dr. Drucker began developing Gleevec the same year that I was born, and it was FDA approved just one month before I was diagnosed. And if you want to talk about timing, that's some of the best that I've ever heard. It's because of the Knight Cancer Institute that this timing is possible. It's because of the Knight Cancer Institute that Dr. Drucker was able to develop this groundbreaking new drug. It's because of Brian that I got to carry a first place trophy back to my dance team at State. And it's because of the Knight Cancer Institute that I'm going to school to become a nurse. Can you imagine a world where cancer is merely a memory? Brian Drucker, Phil Knight, and you together are making this a reality. And I personally thank you. Katie, thank you. Katie is now living her dream and is a nurse at the OHSU hospitals and clinics, 
working in our pediatric wards. So the reality, though, is that imatinib isn't perfect. When you look at our five-year risk of relapse, it runs about 17% of patients will have resistance. What we've learned from the work of, of many around, around the world is that the major cause of relapse, about 60%, are mutations in the b able kinase itself, and about 40% are other signaling mechanisms. What that's led to is the development of four new drugs to target the kinase-resistant mutations. So we now have imatinib as the current standard of therapy, significantly prolonging survival. We have relapses mostly due to kinase domain mutations, and we have novel ABLE inhibitors that show substantial activity in patients with these mutations. All four have been FDA approved and are now being used in newly diagnosed patients. And this disease has been converted to a manageable condition. And even more remarkably, some of the patients with the deepest responses have been able to discontinue therapy, and it seems to be permanent as it's been well in excess of five years off therapy, although that is a minority. So where else has imatinib worked? The three targets of imatinib are ABLE, KIT, and the PDGF receptor. And we see activity in diseases driven by each of these three oncogenes. Gastrointestinal stromal tubers, driven by KIT mutations, discovered actually in Japan. Melanoma, a rare 2% have KIT mutations. And then a couple of skin disorders, hypersinophilic syndrome, driven by PDGF receptor mutations, and DFSP, driven by PDGF ligand overexpression. Imatinib, though, has been tried in numerous other malignancies where it has not worked despite an expression of the target, and that just tells us that the target expression is not enough. We need dependence of the cancer on the abnormal target. So what lessons have we learned? And for me, we have to identify the right targets. And if you have the right target and a good drug, you can get good results. It really can be that simple. But for as long as I've given these talks, you can tell I've put a lot of emphasis on the target. But there have been several recent examples where relatively poor drugs have almost killed good targets. So it's clear to me that we do need the combination of good targets and good drugs to get good results. So how do we translate this to other cancers? Well, first of all, we need the right targets. And to my way of thinking, these are going to be the early molecular pathogenic targets in cancer. But a lesson that often gets forgotten in all of this is that chronic myeloid leukemia is a model of an early cancer. It progresses over time from a chronic leukemia to an acute leukemia. We treated the chronic stage that has a three to five year lead before it becomes a full-blown acute cancer or acute leukemia. So, to extend this paradigm and see the success that we've seen with imatinib, we have to treat earlier in the course of the disease as opposed to advanced metastatic cancer where we see far more molecular heterogeneity. And to do that, we have to do much, much better identifying cancer at these earlier, more treatable stages. And of course, we have to do much better at matching the right patient with the right drug. So when you think about where we are, we're still relatively early in this evolution toward what people are calling precision oncology. We still do largely treat cancers by their site of origin. The treatments are still largely empiric, including many of our immunotherapeutics now, which are remarkable tools, but are still used largely empirically. And our response rates are relatively low, and we can't yet predict which patients respond. So as I think about the future, we have to think about taking a patient's sample and characterizing the tumor extensively, not only the tumor but the surrounding microenvironment, as well as surveying the immune status of the patient and the tumor. We need to turn that around as quickly as we possibly can, possibly even within two days to make treatment decisions. So one of the things that we need to think about is taking that patient's sample, looking at the genome, looking at what's expressed, looking at what pathways are activated, looking at 
what the immunophenotype is of the cancer in the surrounding microenvironment, thinking about PDX models, thinking about screening, then running that through our computational algorithms and using that to design treatments. Now, you might think this is a little bit of science fiction, but in the next month, our group is publishing a paper in Nature where we've been looking at patients with AML. And we've been doing pretty much a fair bit of this. We've been taking the mutation, expression profiling, and functional screening, and looking at what drugs patients might respond to. So that was 600 patients with leukemia. All that data will be made publicly available once the manuscript is published. So again, we're already beginning to see that, that accomplishing this is actually doable, and we are now turning that into a clinical trial in patients with AML, which is the most le lethal leukemia, with a survival rate, if you're over 60, of about 10% at five years. So coming back to what we did in the last century with infectious diseases, well, we took a broad-based approach. It's my view that in this century will be the century where we can do the same thing for cancer. We can think about specific targeted therapies directed at critical targets like imatinib and many, many others. We also have to think about modulating the immune system. As I mentioned, we've seen remarkable activity with some of the checkpoint inhibitors and other immune therapies. We need to learn better how they're working and how to improve their ability to work. But we can't also forget prevention and early diagnosis. The best way to treat cancer is not to get it in the first place. The second best way would be to treat it early, but we also need to have that safety net for patients who are diagnosed with an advanced cancer. So in closing, I'd like to thank particularly all of my patients who went on this journey with me. All these are some of my phase one patients from 20 years ago now, who are still alive and doing many of the things they enjoy. This person gardening, this patient, the first patient from Italy who was treated with imatinib, who enjoys dancing, this woman, from Southwest Washington, who was referred to me from hospice. And these are her children from a picture in 2000. She now has great-grandchildren from the daughter on the right. Lots of patients traveling to Oregon to receive a matinib on our clinical trials. And some patients doing some remarkably and extraordinary things. This is the first patient treated from Australia in the year 2000. She returned to her home company and selected as one of the torchbearers in the 2000 Sydney Olympics. But the reality is I've shown you individuals, and when you start to think about this, it all begins to add up to groups. And for me, this is my hope for cancer. We'll take each cancer, each subtype of cancer, one at a time. But pretty soon it starts to add up, and we'll see far more pictures like this of patients surviving and thriving despite a diagnosis of cancer. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Drucker, for your uh, most inspiring lecture, showing us uh, how to uh, pursue problems even when everybody says it cannot be done, and you succeeded. Uh, and uh, this, you made a marvelous uh, breakthrough based on your uh, uh, ability to uh, dissect the problem and pick the right approach. Uh, now we uh, have the third uh, lecture, the laureate lecture. Uh, the third laureate is Dr. John Mendelson. He received his uh, medical training at Harvard University Medical School, and then he went on to uh, receive uh, medical training at Peter Van Brigham Hospital and Washington University at St. Louis, and then he uh, became uh, a professor at UC San Diego, where he was the founding director of the Cancer Center from 1976 to 85. After uh, serving as a uh, faculty at Cornell Medical College, he went to, uh, the, uh, uh, went to uh, Houston to become the um, uh, 
professor of genomic medicine and uh, experimental therapeutics of the division cancer medicine of the UT MD Anderson Cancer Center. He became the president of the UT uh, Medical Center, uh, UT Medical uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center president in 1996, which he served until 2001. He has received many awards and honors, including the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Medal of Honor from American Cancer Society, the uh, AACR Prize for Translational Cancer Research, the um, Fulbright Lifetime Achievement Medal, and the um, Gold Medal of Paris, uh, among many others. He's also an honorary, uh, ha has an honorary doctoral degree from uh, the uh, China Medical University here in Taiwan. He is not able to uh, give his lecture here due to health reason, but uh, we're very uh, pleased and honored to have uh, Professor Ming-Chi Hong to give the lecture. Professor Hong received his uh, undergraduate training at National Taiwan University, and then his graduate training from Brandeis University in biochemistry. Uh, he received uh, additional training uh, in uh, MIT, and then he uh, became a professor and chair of the Department of Molecular and Cellular Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. He uh, was elected as a member of Taiwan's Academia Sinica, and uh, he is also an honorary director of the Center of Molecular Medicine of the China Medical University Hospital. Uh, today, he's going to speak to us on precision cancer medicine, achievements and perspectives. Let's welcome Professor Hong. Can you hear me? Is it, is it right? Okay. So, I'm extremely honored to be here today to present this Town Prize 2018 Laurie Lecture for Dr. John Mellison. He's the President Emeritus of University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. As Dr. Chen earlier mentioned, that because of his illness, he couldn't come today. So I'm extremely honored to be here to present his achievement, and I'll give a brief uh, uh, background introduction for himself, and also at the end, try to share with you his vision for the future cancer therapy. And I'm also pleased to mention that Although Dr. Mendelssohn couldn't come to receive this award, that his son, Jack Mendelssohn, who is right here, uh, <clears throat> he was, uh, yesterday he was in the uh, award ceremony to receive the award uh, for Dr. Mendelssohn. Jack, send my uh, best regard to your father. Okay, so as I mentioned, I will, since I present this one for Dr. Mendelssohn, so I would like to spend just a few minutes to briefly introduce his background, although Dr. Chen Shi also mentioned a little bit already. John Mendelssohn came to MD Anderson 1996, and he served as a president for 15 years, stepped down at a time when he was 75 years old, and stepped down for presidentship in 2011 but he did not retire. He continued to serve, and until this year, he just retired last month. He was the one who actually transformed MD Anderson Cancer Center, and now in the United States, for most of the time, the ranking for Cancer Center, MD Anderson was lucky to rank, always ranking number one, and he, Dr. Mendelssohn, is a major key person who pushed that uh, MD Anderson into this stage. 
He graduated from Harvard College, bachelor's degree, and then he received a very prestigious award, a Fulbright Scholar, went to Scotland to learn molecular biology, and at that time it was an inference stage of molecular biology. Then he came back to the US, received the MD degree, 1963. After his uh, graduate from uh, his MD degree through his uh, residence fellow training. Event at the end, then he went to University of California, San Diego to become the, the funding director of the cancer center. So he stayed there for almost 10 years from 1976 to 85 and as a funding director for Cancer Center. Now, this Cancer Center has become one of the premier cancer center in the United States. As a matter of fact, I will quote that today's one of our OOD, Dr. Brian Juker was uh, a student there, and when Dr. Mendelssohn uh, was a cancer center. Also, Dr. Tony Hunter, although he's not a member of Cancer Center, but he was a joint faculty uh, with the UC San Diego. As a matter of fact, today, seems we have a lot of relationship with UC San Diego because our host, Dr. Chen Xu, was a professor from UC San Diego too. What a coincidence, just like uh, today was September 22nd, 922, Chromosome, Philadelphia chromosome translocation 922, uh, where it causes the uh, CML uh, disease. Very nice co uh, coincidence. Then, after 10 years served in the uh, UC uh, San Diego Cancer Center, he was recruited to the Big Apple. New York City, the, at that time, the number one cancer center, always, that it Memory Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. He stayed there as the department chair for medicine to run major medicine uh, clinical trial and the, the major uh, clinical activity. During that period of time, about 10 years, no question that Memory Sloan Kettering was the number one cancer center in the United States. Then, 1996, that year, I have served in MD Anderson for 10 years, and we are looking for our new leadership. 1996, MD Anderson is so lucky to be able to attract Dr. John Anderson to move from New York City, go to the South, Houston, Texas, to leading MD Anderson Cancer Center as the president. Then he served, as I mentioned earlier, 15 years as a presidentship, and during his presidentship, uh, in MD Anderson, he actually transformed MD Anderson. Our size was increased almost four times during the 15 years. And he also moved the number one title, quote, from Sloan Catering, New York City, to Houston, Texas. Ever since now, MD Anderson in the United States, most of the time, we are fortunately ranking at the number one cancer center. And probably a lot related to Dr. John Mendelson. However, it is not really important to say who is ranking number one or number two. What is the most important thing as a cancer center is how we can develop new therapy to treat cancer patients. I just give you one data, for example. One out of three drugs in the United States been approved by US FDA. The clinical trial has been done in MD Anderson Cancer Center. MD Anderson, today we have almost 1,000 new clinical trials ongoing every year. And after he read stepped down from presidentship when he was 75 years old in 2011, he did not retire. Because his vision is to establish a 
Personal Cancer Therapy Institute. So then, after he stepped down from presidentship, he ran a director, he served as a director of uh, Personal Cancer uh, uh, Institute inside MD Anderson. Dr. Chen Shi has earlier mentioned his credit, so I just quickly say that, that some of his scientific achievement that in early 1980, he and his colleague, Golden Sato, had made this first hypothesis that inhibition of EGF epidermal growth factor receptor that an overtyrosine kinase could be an effective anti cancer treatment. At the time we make this hypothesis, it was in early 1980, and then he went ahead, developed monoclonal antibody against EGL receptor, and then to show in the laboratory that has tumor suppression activity, and then went ahead to move into clinical trial. And as Dr. Brian Drucker earlier mentioned, even the Glivac was an excellent drug which cures so many CML patients, but at the early stage that people are skeptical that how can a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that as an anti-cancer drug because it's going to be toxic and so on. The same thing applies to this monoclonal antibody, who at the time when Dr. Mendelssohn and uh, Dr. Golden Arsato had this hypothesis, actually, Dr. Mendelssohn told me at that time he couldn't get a grant if when you use the easier receptor monoclonal antibody as a grant proposal because the reviewer are always very critical. This is impossible to use a monoclonal antibody to target a receptor as an anti-cancer drug. But now we all know monoclonal antibody is a standard methodology to develop drug, not only cancer, but all multiple uh, different diseases, as long as you can against self service receptor. And EGL receptor, obviously, is one of the prototype uh, uh, receptor that monoclonal body has been successful uh, uh, to be developed. And Dr. Mendelssohn was the key person, proposed hypothesis, persistently develop antibody, move into clinical trial, and go to more than two decades to make sure this drug was approved by FDA to treat cancer patients. So C225 was at a time in the laboratory, they named this uh, uh, monoclonal but we, in the lab, we sometimes still use this uh, term, although now it's been humanized now. Uh, the FDA approved drug is named it as Cetuzumab, or Erbitax. The first FDA appro approval was 2004 to treat a colon uh, colorectal cancer. Two years later, head and neck cancer was also approved to uh, treat a uh, head and neck cancer patient. And I had to mention the monoclonal body was developed two decades before the drug was approved. And because this is one of the prototype uh, monoclonal body being as a drug, and so a lot of uh, analogy in the scientific community you need to learn how to make a drug, uh, any, anybody become a drug. For example, you have to humanize it and so on. Now a day, monoclonal body is a standard, standard method to develop a whole kinds of medicine and you don't need two decades to be approved. In addition to EGL receptor, monoclonal body, Dr. Mendelssohn, while he was in Sloan Kettering, chairing the Department of Medicine, he has also actively involved the clinical trial of the Herceptin or Tratuzuma. This is a drug developed by Genetic in San Francisco, target a, another receptor, tyrosine kinase called HER2 or NU in breast cancer. HER2 is a brother of EGL receptor. The abbreviation HER2 is actually named human EGL receptor number two. So you can see their brother, they are the same family. And it was last new because at the time, almost at the same time, time that when the HER2 gene and new, red new oncogene was identified, was cloned, 
and the new was cloned by Dr. Robert Weinberg's laboratory in MIT. While I was a postdoc fellow, I was a lot very lucky to be involved in cloning of this red new oncogene. So ever since then, I have been working on breast cancer. So Dr. Mendelssohn, in addition to each receptor, proposed the concept and all the way to push this monoclonal body become a FDA-approved drug. He also involved in other uh, related receptor tyrosine kinase clinical trial. Dr. Uh, uh, Chen Shi has earlier mentioned quite a few of his honor. Let me just quickly mention a few things that he was an American Cancer Society professor, and he received gold medal of Paris, and he is also an elected member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science in the U.S., and now the name is changed into a uh, member of the National Academy of Medicine now. He was also an elected member of the Royal uh, Netherlands Academy of Art and Science. He received then David Price in Cancer Therapy in 2006, and also uh, I've been earlier mentioned that in 2005, Dr. Mendelssohn and his lovely wife, and Mendelssohn actually visited Taiwan and received an honorable doctor and professor degree in China Mango University in Taichung. That year, he actually visited Taiwan's President Palace. And at that time, President was Chen shui So, as a background, before I mention his uh, hypothesis, it was, his hypothesis was primarily based on that this earlier work from Dr. Cohen, Stanley Cohen, who, who was the pioneer person identified EGF as a critical growth factor, and later on that showed it, this growth factor had to interact with cell surface receptor protein called EGF receptor, and this interaction turned out to be a very critical interaction to allow a growth factor, go to growth factor receptor to stimulate cell growth and so on. And then through many scientists' contribution that EGF or another lichen called TGF alpha was shown to be able to form so-called autocrine model, i.e. tumor cell has a receptor by itself, overexpressed lichen, and so make this tumor cell grow abnormally. And then, of course, that following Dr. Uh, Tony Hunter's discovery of tyrosine kinase in SARC, then uh, Stanley Cohen that have also discovered that the EGL receptor has a tyrosine kinase activity, and later on, EGL receptor was shown to be overexpressed in many different kinds of cancer, including brain tumor, colon cancer, and head and neck cancer. So with all this background, so in the early 1980, Dr. Mendelssohn and the Golden Sato then make this hypothesis, that is monoclonal antibody, which can bind into EGF receptor and therefore to block the lichen EGF or here the other, uh, to prevent from cell proliferation and by inhibiting activation of EGL receptor tyrosine kinase. It's just a hypothesis in the early 1980 when he served as a uh, funding director in UC uh, Cancer Center, uh, uh, UC San Diego Cancer Center. And this concept then, with his team, started to generate this monoclonal antibody, as I mentioned, back to the old day, it is named C2. To five. And please look at this panel. Here is a simple Western blot. And remember back to the old day that in order to detect a tyrosine phosphorylation, that was before monoclonal body against phosphotyrosine uh, are available, this would have to use a cell, had to be incubated with a high uh, radioisotope P32. And so then you can detect it phosphorylating uh, P32, uh, a radioactive P32 uh, in the protein. So you can see here, when a cell stimulates with lichen, 
one, panel one, no lichen. Panel two, you add a lichen, you do see the phosphorylation increase. You don't know what kind of phosphorylation, but you do see phosphorylation increase. However, in the panel three and panel four, then when you start to eat at this monoclonal body, C225, which against EGF receptor, to prevent the lichen EGF to bind into EGF receptor, you do see this phosphorylation was reduced. Then in order to further validate what kind of phosphorylation this is, then use this, uh, I think this data, this technology Dr. Tony Hunter earlier has showed using this uh, 2D uh, electrophoresis that you can see that this phosphorylation, the two spot, is well known earlier at the time that it's a serine threonine phosphorylation. And then after the lichen stimulation in this uh, panel two, you do see this extra spot, and this one is tyrosine phosphorylation, which originally was identified, developed, and this method was developed by uh, Dr. Tony Hunter. And then now, if you add this C225 monoclonal body to block EGF to bind into EGF receptor, now you still see serine threonine phosphorylation. However, this tyrosine phosphorylation, which is critical to stimulate cell growth, now dis disappear. So this is a very preliminary result in the laboratory, laboratory on the bench. And with that, then, then continue to move ahead. And here I want to make a point to thanks to uh, Dr. Um, Brian Juker, that nowadays, when people do detect this phosphotyrosine, you don't really have to use the P32 label now. I think many people in the lab, uh, if you are, are working in the lab in this area, you know you have a monoclonal body called 4G10. Now, 4G10 monoclonal body, you can just easily to detect it, this phosphotyrosine. And 4G10 monoclonal body against phosphotyrosine was the one who developed by uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Juker. And my lab used that all the time, too. <laughs> okay. And so, with this in mind, then they, Dr. Mendelssohn, and together with his group, they moved into a very pilot animal experiment. He was taking advantage of, at that time, the new mice, the thymic, uh, uh, mice are available. So you can see, then when you take a tumor cell with the easier receptor of expression, you inject into the new mice, tumor develops. However, when you treat with this C225 monoclonal body, you see the tumor development was significantly suppressed. This indicates the tumor suppression activity it was early 1980. Frankly speaking, nowadays in the literature, if you go to any cancer journal, any therapeutic paper, it was very easy to see this kind of data. However, back to the early 1980, this is a very impressive data. And then, of course, with that, then he moved into clinical trial. And in, for the almost 10 year time, that start from hypothesis and produce the reagent to talk to the tyrosine, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, move the first clinical trial. And then this clinical trial had to back and forth because when you're doing a clinical trial, you realize that there's some issue there. For example, there's a side effect and that anybody had to be humanized and so on. So, Back and forth uh, for the, uh, the clinical trial, and eventually at, at the end, that to show this clinical trial work, and then in 2004, the first uh, FDA approval was uh, 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 occurred to uh, treat colon cancer. In addition to this monoclonal body as a drug per se, that his lab. To get, uh, together with uh, his uh, uh, colleague, has also shown a very dramatic uh, result. That is, the, this monoclonal body against EGL receptor not only suppress tumor, in some cases, actually can overcome some tumor cells which are resistant to certain type of chemotherapy. There are multiple examples like that. But here I just show a one example. That is, for example, this tumor inject to the mice, you see the tumor development. But if you in, treat it with the chemotherapy, doxorubicin, this particular tumor is known to be resistant to doxorubicin. So doxorubicin doesn't really, uh, kind of suppress a little bit, but doesn't really uh, suppress tumor because this tumor was uh, resistant to that. If you use the EGL receptor monoclonal body, 
you suppress a little bit, not really work, but when you use the combination, you see the tumor is gone. So EGI receptor also has the ability to convert those tumor cells who resist certain type of chemotherapy to become sensitive. After that, the drug being approved uh, by FDA. Now, this is a famous that the Hanahan wiper, uh, so-called is uh, uh, hallmark of cancer. And so they summarize this hallmark of uh, uh, cancer, including all different kind of activity that could contribute to the cancer. And EGL receptor inhibitor, this including Cetuzuma monoclonal body, developed by uh, John Mendelson, and of course the EGL receptor, small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And in this hallmark of cancer, I should point it out, in addition to EGL receptor, this VGF blockage and the HGF CMET uh, uh, blockage, both of them are also tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And I'm sure some, uh, some other area, tyrosine kinase is also involved. And here I should also point it out that Tom Price, this is the third time, give this particular area and tyrosine kinase and the blockage of tyrosine kinase activity and to be a turning point of target therapy. And I still remember the first time when the town prize was studied was awarded to the immunocheckpoint therapy or anti-CTLA4 and the anti-PD1, which this one was originally discovered uh, uh, by Jim Allison over in MD Anderson, and then he shared, Jim Allison shared with Dr. Hong Jo uh, in the town prize uh, first of all, and later on I will come back to this one. So here I just show you how important tyrosine kinase is. It is hallmarked, at least three of them directly involve tyrosine kinase blockage and other are likely to be involved. This is a list, uh, I think the data come from last year. This, all these slides are from Dr. Mendelssohn. That this is a list to show that US FDA approved those uh, molecule uh, target uh, oncology agent. So as you can see here, and here is the target, here is the agent, and what kind of uh, molecule that is. Out of 20 drugs, 11, i.e. more than 50% or about 50% target tyrosine kinase. So i.e., if Dr. Tony Hunter did not discover tyrosine kinase, 50% of this drug disappear. 1,000, 10,000, or might be millions patients actually will be affected. And among them, five of them, five out of 20, was actually target EGL receptor, including Satutuma, or Jafinian, uh, the tyrosine kinase small molecule inhibitor, and, and primarily because EGL receptor is a prototype of receptor tyrosine kinase that have been served as a target therapy. That's why there are so many drugs against that. And I should also point it out, the most amazing tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Glivac, imatinib, that which uh, Brian just mentioned earlier. As a matter of fact, I have to say, this uh, Glivac, Imatinib drug at the time when they treat with the CML, as the, the data is shown. This original is a disease, no cure, but now the five-year survival rate, it's up to 90%. Even some of the patients will develop resistance and their second generation of drugs are continuing. This is an amazing uh, drug that which turn the target therapy field start to become very active rolling. With all this stuff, at the time when Dr. Mendelssohn retired, he actually summarized in this kind of concept. Therefore, he would try to establish a so-called personal cancer therapy institute. That is, he said, we have identified most of the genetic abnormality that cause cancer. And let me just give you a little bit of In early 2000, when the sequencing has been developed. The entire human genome, three B 
billion base pair pin uncoded. Now, those cancer patients, what kind of mutation uh, those tumor cell has can be easy to by sequencing. And now a day, probably in a couple of days, and maybe less than 1,000 US dollar, depending on which place uh, you do the sequence, you'll be able to determine your DNA sequence, uh, the tumor DNA sequence quickly. I still remember in the old day, if, I, if Tony and Brian, uh, I'm sure all of us would have done this DNA sequence. Back to the old day when Maxim Gilbert and Sanger just developed sequencing in the mid 70s to determine 1,000 base pair, it would take a whole year. It would take a whole year, I'm not kidding, because that's part of my PhD thesis too. However, today, three billion base pair for one human genome can be done in a couple of days. That's technology developed so fast. And with those kind of technology developed, so Dr. Mendelssohn feel now since we have all so much data, we know what kind of, when the patient comes to the hospital, what kind of mutation can be easy to detect. And in addition to those FDA approved drugs, that there are almost 800 different kind of drugs in the pipeline, when I say in the pipeline, they are either in clinical trial or they are in the preclinical uh, uh, development. Those drugs are already available to target product of the different kind of gene. For example, once you know a particular gene mutation or a particular gene overexpression, then you can develop inhibit on that. So he thought that this particular molecule could be using as a biomarker. For example, mm -hmm. using Philadelphia chromosome that what uh, uh, Brian Jukum uh, mentioned earlier, that chromosome 922 translocation BCR able could be a biomarker to identify what tumor could be treated with the cleavage and so on. So using this, and now as I mentioned, now relatively pretty short time and a reasonable cost, uh, one can determine the tumor DNA sequence. So based on this one, there are a lot of examples, and the BCR able is one of the good examples. Her, her, sub, uh, her two overexpression is the other one, EJ receptor overexpression, and another one. All those uh, are patients uh, who has abnormality of the biomarker that one can develop inhibitor. So here just summarize some of those uh, very successful one, and as mentioned, this has been mentioned quite a few times, that Glivac, that for CMO, this is probably one of the best examples for tyrosine kinase to inhibitor or uh, to treat with a cancer patient. So with all these uh, available biomarker to allow us to identify right patient to be treated right drug, so at the time when Dr. John Mendelssohn retired in 2011, he would establish a personalized cancer therapy institute inside MD Anderson. And the goal is following, and this is a huge uh, project and it's still moving and I likely, I predict it's likely to have a huge impact on the cancer therapy in the future. That is to create infrastructure and platform which could be able to systematically to genetic analyze the patient's tumor tissue by sequencing. And then to support, after you identify the tumor uh, mutation, you, you should be able to support clinical trial and then bring uh, the right therapeutic drug to treat the right patient. Then, later on you see, this is gonna be a generate a huge number of data, so it is important those huge uh, uh, data base can be available to help, patient, uh, to help uh, the, uh, the clinician to make a decision to support the personal cancer therapy. And as the Brian earlier mentioned, even CML, even the Glivac is such a dramatic anti-cancer drug. Eventually, some of the patients still develop resistance. Many receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors all develop resistance. And that one would have to be understand their mechanism and so that to develop matter to block resistance. And very importantly, although it's not scientific directly related, that it, we would like to demonstrate this value of approach be such a way that can become a standard of practice cancer patient treatment and can be reimbursed. Otherwise, cancer treatment can be extremely costly. So here, for this uh, uh, institution of personal cancer therapy, 
uh, in M. Tinnison, we initiated the following, and that this was led by Dr. John Mendelson after he retired from presidentship. At the time, he was 75 years old. So we started first use 50 gin set. These are the gin. So all expectation for out of 2,000 patients with all different kinds of cancer come in, sequence all these 50 gin. And here is less than this, the, the, the percentage of the mutation of a different gene that uh, contribute to different type of uh, cancer. Then from there, estimation approximately almost 40% of those mutations would are considered to be actionable. When I say actionable, meaning potentially after you identify mutation, they may have the drug to be treated. Okay. So as I mentioned, the out of 50 gym panel, almost 40% are actionable, and then at the end, only 11% of the patient was really moved in clinical trial because of different kind of combination. Later on, when this project was ongoing, then this 50 gene panel was expanded to 400 gene panel, and that increased this uh, action gene almost 50% of the patient. This includes all different kind of cancer. So almost 50% of the patient are now uh, potentially actionable, and then Total 24% are enrolled in clinical trial. And in the next slide, I'd like to quickly share with you all these different kind of uh, molecule, all these different kind of gene, either mutation or implication or abnormality. And here, the corresponding drug by different kind of company. So here, uh, involve almost 80 different kind of alteration, either mutation, implication, and so on. And then involve 44 different drugs from different kind of company, and almost 50 clinical trials. So those patients come in, it's not like you're breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, no. You're a cancer patient. You come in, you sequence it. Then based on the sequence, you group them into at a different kind of a clinical trial. This experiment is still ongoing, and I'm sure this is going to generate a huge number of data. And in the future, likely, likely, we are hoping that either in the future for this, at this moment, this kind of experiment are very expensive, but in the future may become very cheap, and then maybe in the future this is the way that to treat a cancer patient, that is, cancer patient coming, sequence and then group, individualized. And if one inhibitor fails, you could try another inhibitor because you are, the mutation is already known. That's one possibility. Alternatively, after all these data have been collected, I would not be surprised there may be some group that one can come out with a certain type of cocktail, either two inhibitor or three inhibitor, and then all these patients may be able to group at group A, group B, group C, and group A to treat it with one type of cocktail, group B to treat with another cocktail, uh, cocktail uh, combination. So under that situation, this so-called personalized therapy the, will not be that personalized anymore. It's become a group now. So those will be in the future that we can, after the data are collected, and then, so based on this big data analysis, then from the data analysis that one may be able to come a strategy uh, to treat with a cancer patient in the future. So that would have to wait and see. Is that going to be in the future all personal therapy or maybe become a group? Therapy. Of course, ideally, if you can identify a set of cocktail and all cancer are used the same drug, that would be a dream. And whether that dream can become true, I don't know, with the head witness. So here is a list of the dream that Dr. Mendelssohn, when he at the time when he retired, that's in his list. As uh, Brian mentioned earlier, Cancer therapy is important, but to have early diagnosis and prevention are important. So he was dreaming that using uh, the biomarker to have diagnosis and intervention to, to treatment. And then this biomarker not necessarily have to be a tumor. Ideally, it could be from body fluid, for example, from serum or from urine. And as I mentioned earlier, 
it is important to integrate and share all these big data, including all the clinical response, biomarker, immunological, and image, imaging data. And then in the future, yeah, those, uh, all, uh, those data could be developed and then could help to guide physicians' decision to support specific treatment and so on. Most importantly for therapy, that is evidence-based combination therapy. And I would have to say, today, we're talking about tyrosine kinase target therapy. So I, and then earlier, Brian also mentioned about immuno checkpoint therapy and Tom's Price uh, uh, six years ago actually gave in this area. That is immuno checkpoint therapy. I believe combination of between these two or maybe other will be a very important effective combination therapy for the future cancer therapy. And here, I would like to share with you, this is a very famous, the first Chinese medicine book. And I do not expect Brian or Tony or Jeff will read it, but I'm sure many of the audience know Huang Di Nijin. This book was saying, this was published almost a thousand years ago. When you treat a disease, it is important to have a zhen qi chun nei, xie bu ke gao. What this means is when you deal with the disease, two important factors. First one, qi xie, eliminate evil, target therapy. So you want to kill the cancer cell. The other one is fu zhen. What is fu zhen? Strengthen body resistance, strengthen your immune response, and this will be immuno. Therapy. And this was predicted in the first Chinese medicine book. And I tried to find out when this book was officially published. Actually, I don't know. I don't know if it's 1,000 or 2,000 years because nobody know it. But it was hanging around. And, okay. So, and then here, I'd like to share with you the effort inside MT Anderson that we are trying to uh, use in this kind of combination therapy for treatment. As I mentioned earlier, that monoclonal body, such as satuzuma, has now been a standard way. For immuno checkpoint, they also use a monoclonal body against the so-called PT-1 or, or anti-CT or F4. And I don't want to go to those details. For those who know it, you know what is that. So this is a clinical trial outcome for melanoma. Keep in mind, melanoma, it is also a disease very difficult to cure. It's a solid tube. Tumor, there's no effective drug. Not until now, this immuno checkpoint theory come out. So here's clinical trial data. So therefore, every spot, it's one patient's life. It's not mice. This is the clinical trial result. And this disease is known, there's no cure before this drug was developed. So you can see here, anti-CTL4, pretty significant 30% survival. This is the 2015 data. Now the new data come out. This is about 44 years now. Continue. The line is continued. Anti-CT of uh, anti-PD-1, it's about 50 to 60 percent combination. It's close to 50 to 60 percent. What, what the data tell us is a disease no cure. Now with this kind of treatment combination that one can reach to 50 or even 60 percent survival for up to four to five years. Not as good as CML leukemia, but for this type of solid tumor, this type of data at this moment in the field was considered probably the best clinical outcome for the solid tumor. And today we are celebrating the three uh, laureate who developed tyrosine kinase, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and create so-called target therapy and that make anti uh, cancer therapy one big step ahead. But earlier we have talked about when we had to look at an area, one had to think about out of box and should not forget it in the box either. So as a scientist, I think we should just think of whatever you want to think. This is a very impressive data for a disease, no cure, then your new drug help patient to survive for 60%. But why not 
What's wrong with that? Can we achieve that? Let me use today's story as an example. 40 years ago, Tony discovered fossil towers, discovered towers in China. 40 years later, there are tons of anti-cancer drugs based on towers in China. And the best example is that CML uh, Glivac, and including uh, Cetuzuma developed by John Mendelssohn. Are we going to wait for another 40 years from this 50, 60 percent up to 100 percent? This is a tough question, but if you ask me, my answer is no. It is not 40 years. I don't know when. I'm not saying next year. I'm not saying tomorrow, but the time is coming. So here I just share with you that some approach we're thinking that we know solid tumor are heterogeneity. So one way to do it, and earlier that the uh, speaker has been, uh, uh, our laureate has been already mentioned about effective combination therapy. And this particular trial is one of the effective combination therapy. And here I want to show with you a little bit of effort in MDNs. And MDNs has, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, uh, more than 1,000 clinical trial and more about close to 200 clinical trials on immune checkpoint. And then in preclinical study, we have shown that uh, that's very nice. Don't worry, don't worry about this one. Here I just want to show this is one of the combination therapy between a kinase inhibitor plus an immuno checkpoint therapy. And to deal with the disease at this moment, also no cure. That is triple negative breast cancer. For those of people who know breast cancer is not a big disease now. However, triple negative is still no effective therapy. Then this survival curve, what I share with you, is a model, this is an animal model, you don't treat them, they all die. But when you treat them with metformin, which is a diabetes drug, and it's already known metformin can activate AMPK. Then by making them treatment study, we've noticed that metformin activate AMPK can downregulate the PTO1 and enhance CTO activity. So if you use metformin by cell, it doesn't work. But then when you use anti ctl 4 you see the 10% survival. And this survival is one year tumor free. However, if you use a combination between performance and anti CD4, this is 50% tumor free. And this is triple negative disease, and this disease at this moment has no effective drug. The same combination therapy can be applied to other cancer type, colon cancer and melanoma. So, this is one example that target therapy and immuno checkpoint therapy combine together. Alternatively, I'll share with you another one, that is what we say about combination therapy. Either they are two drugs add together as a cocktail, or make one drug, two drugs link into one drug, and so become a multiple function. In this particular case, this is the anti pt l one antibody as a therapeutic agent. Now, you added a very strong chemotherapy drug four molecules per one. So now this is so-called ADC, antibody drug conjugate. For this particular drug, when we treat the animal, and just to save the time to show the survival curve here. Again, this is triple negative breast cancer model. You don't treat them, they all die. You treat the antibody alone. This antibody has been tested in human. There are multiple, there are at least five drugs have been approved by FDA, this kind of anti-PT1 or anti-PT01. Breast cancer solid tumor model, it's about 20, 30% response rate. So this animal data actually recap, uh, recapitulate the human data. Now, my friend, please look at this red line. This one is this drug, antibody plus and antibody drug contribute. This is 80%. And this is a disease at this moment has no cure. A data like this, triple negative breast cancer. Now we have extend to colon cancer and melanoma cancer model results are similar. Here I also want to share with you that all this model is model. Model is not real. Because this model you're using at one single cell line with a PTL1 positive. However, we do know solid tumors are heterogeneous. 
Not every tumor cell express PTO1. Some tumor cell express, some don't. So if you use immuno checkpoint, you are primarily target PTL1 positive tumor cell. But those PTL1 negative tumor cell, you cannot kill them. Therefore, at the time when we develop this drug, we on purpose to keep in mind that that can induce a so-called bystander effect. Bystander effect, in a very simple term, is like this. Assuming this room is a solid tumor, and each person is one tumor cell. And the one who wear glasses is a PTL1 positive. The one without glasses is PTL1 negative. So if you use an immuno checkpoint, anti PT1 or PT1 antibody, you should only target the one wear glasses. The one wear glasses will be killed. The one without glasses survive. However, by standard effect, meaning I don't give it, excuse my language, I don't care. Just I target the one well glasses, but when the, the one well glasses that PT1 positive tumor cell be killed, those PT1 negative cell next to the PT1 positive cell was also killed. That's called bystander effect. So simple term. So here just quickly show the data, the bystander effect. So if I use this antibody uh, uh, drug conjugate to incubate it with the tumor cell in vitro, then they are PTO1 positive, so those tumor cells are killed, this is yellow color. However, this tumor cell, if you knock down PTO1, so they no longer have PTO1, otherwise it's the same cell. You use this drug, you cannot kill them now because there's no PTO1. So you kill the PTO1 positive with glasses, this one without glasses, you don't kill them. Now, you mix them one by one, put together next to each other. All of them are killed. It's a red color. 0409 culture, the same result. Here's in vivo result. It's similar. So now we have this drug, which in the animal model, reach 80 to 90% in solid tumor model, and this induced by standing effect that anybody has been humanized, and we are looking forward to be able to move it in clinical trial. So today we get together that we uh, to celebrate the three laureate who has a pioneer work who had transformed our cancer therapy to create so-called target therapy. And then I think that we should work together uh, to be able to make a cancer history. So at the very end, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate Tony for your discovery of tyrosine kinase and Brian, your unbelievable clever drug to cure a cancer patient up to 90%, and of course, Dr. John Mendelson for his development of the uh, Cetuzma monoclonal body and his leadership in the entire cancer area. At the end, I'll say congratulations, and to three of you, I show salute. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hong, for your marvelous uh, lecture on behalf of Dr. John Mendelssohn. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we had a wonderful session this morning uh, with uh, fantastic lectures uh, given by Drs. Hunter, Drucker, and Hong. These lectures are truly inspiring and stimulating. It showed us how the uh, tyrosine kinase system was developed and then applied for the treatment of cancers through the use of inhibitors and receptor blockers. And the end result is to improve human health by combating, combating this dreadful disease of cancer. It gives us many inspirations, such as the, oh, how to overcome difficulties, whether it's a review by uh, journals or uh, the drug developers said no, and all the other things, but if we have the right way, we should persist and work on it. So this is not only for those uh, working on cancer, but on biomedical research in general. These are most inspiring. And the other thing is we see how basic, outstanding basic science developed can be translated to clinical medicine to benefit patients. So we should all follow 
this kind of example. This is indeed uh, marvelous uh, examples for us to follow. So th today, this lecture uh, session is uh, really extremely uh, beneficial to all of us. It is to the researchers, eventually to the patients. So with this, uh, we'd like to congratulate and thank our remarkable laureates and they are fulfilling the spirit of the town price, that is to improve the welfare of uh, humankind. Uh, that is, in this case, uh, through biopharmaceutical uh, activities, but all of these uh, town prices are aimed at improving the humankind uh, in their uh, health uh, and well-being. So let us, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in uh, expressing our appreciation, uh, congratulation, and gratitude to the three laureates, uh, Drs. Uh, Tony Hunter, uh, Brian Drucker, John Mandelson, represented by his son Jeff, uh, and also Ming Chi for giving the lecture. Let's give them uh, the warmest <laughs> thanks and appreciation. Thank you very much to Professor Chen for hosting this lecture session for us. And thank you again to Dr. Hunter, Dr. Drucker, and Dr. Hong for your inspiring lectures. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the biopharmaceutical science lecture. Thank you very much for your participation today. If you have any questions regarding the lecture, you're welcome to join the press conference on the first floor. 各位来宾，第三届唐奖得奖人演讲《生技医药厂》到这边圆满结束。非常感谢您今天的参与。如果您希望针对演讲内容提问，请移驾至一楼的前瞻厅。离场的时候，请记得您随身携带的物品，并归还您所借取的同步口译接收器，取回您的证件。场内稍后我们会进行清场。有报名下一场的来宾，请在场外重新报道。谢谢您的配合。